thanks for inviting me to give this talk in this nice conference. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about some new ADS3 solutions that uh, were previously discovered by other authors, but we have uh, found some explicit realizations. These solutions has uh, have, have, have maximal supersymmetry, where maximal supersymmetry in ADS3 would be half maximal with respect to what type to be uh, has. So, uh, so, so we start uh, saying that ADS3 compactifications of strings and supergravity are of great interest in the context of the ADS-C ADS-CFT correspondence because they are supposed to describe duals of two-dimensional conformal field theories. And uh, strings in ADS3 were studied since the late 90s, uh, starting from pure NS, NS backgrounds, that is where the most simplest uh, settings where one can uh, study this this string theory. So correlation functions were computed, the spectra, and some hints of the CFT dual. So uh, if we take the gravity limit in the super strings, super symmetric uh, string case, we can get information about the BPS spectrum. We can uh, a study compactification preserving some amount of super uh, conformal field th super conformal algebra. Um, so ultimately, a precise correspondence uh, was found for the tensionless limits of strings by these authors in uh, 2018. So well-studied cases uh, where those where you have ADS three times S three times M four, where M four could be the four torus or the K3 surface. And uh, another ca background uh, very well studied was the ADS3 times S3 times S3 times S1. So uh, there is a, an interest in finding new solutions, but the classification is harder since the internal space for ADS3 compactifications has uh, seven dimensions. So uh, it's quite uh, hard to, to to classify this, this large uh, number of dimension spaces. So supersymmetric backgrounds historically w were obtained by solving some spinorial conditions that came from the imposing vanishing of supersymmetric variation of the fermions of the supergravity background. There was, uh, there is one more modern approach that based on uh, some B spinner formalism, you construct some B spinners uh, made of out of the killing spinners of your internal manifold, and you see which geometric constraints you can uh, impose that allows that guarantees that you get uh, supersymmetry um, configurations. So there was a G structure classification of n equal one ADS three solutions in type two B supergravity. And uh, following this, there was a renewed effort to construct some a small n equal 4,0 uh, backgrounds. The family of solution described in this talk was discovered in this context. Actually, people were studying uh, the supersymmetric conditions in this more modern approach, but in type 2a, super two a, uh, type 2a supergravity, and they just t-dualized one direction and found the, the type 2b backgrounds that I I'm going to describe. Uh, sorry, I didn't under understand the question. Uh, probably, but uh, I don't know. That's sorry. Thank you. 
Okay. Well, uh, I'm not not going to talk in about the the process of classifying the solutions, but uh, once one of these families of solutions was found, uh, I will focus on the analysis of this type, uh, and this is a this will be a type to be uh, solution actually. So I just start describing this uh, very well known D1 D5 D brain system. So this uh, the simplest of these three solutions that we know appears as, near s as a near horizon limit of uh, the, the 1D5 brain system. So we start with type 2B super string. We compactify on some of these Calabial. I'm, I'm, I'm talking Calabial, but it's just many folks that uh, whose holonomy is included in SU2. So T4 and K3, I'm, I'm calling Calabial, both of them. So uh, once we compactify, we put a number of uh, D1 brains along one non-compact direction of, of a space. So we have uh, D1 brains spanning Minkowski 2, and then we, we put a, a number of D5 brains sharing the same non-compact non direction uh, with, with the D1 brains and wrapping the internal manifold. And once we put these brains, uh, and we need that these are coin coincident on transfer no transverse non-compact directions, then if we go to the near horizon, uh, the geometry is precisely this uh, ADS3 times S3 times M4. So the background is, de is described uh, basically by this. Do we have the metric. Uh, we have a constant dilaton and we have the, the three form uh, Ramon Ramon uh, field strength. And this is given just in terms of the volume forms of, a of the ADS3 and the S3 uh, pieces of the of the background of the target space. So um, here the constant L, lambda, and C uh, just define the background, and this uh, L and lambda related to the number of the brains that we put in the system. So the amount of supersymmetry preserved by this uh, this background is 16 supercharges. Um, so the ADS3 compactification uh, reduces from the, uh, the original 32 of type 2B in flat space to 16. And uh, the ADS CFT correspondence uh, gives a dual two-dimensional superconformal field theory with n equal 4,4 uh, supersymmetry. And in this case, the n equal 4 in both left and right sectors is a small n equal 4 superconformal algebra. So. So now we, we want to to make a, a, generaliz a generalization of these backgrounds um, by trying to to consider warp manifolds. So this was found in 19. Uh, and uh, we actually see that if we warp the space time, then the dilaton becomes non-constant. Here, H5 is, is the, the function that uh, that gives the warping, so we get a uh, we get the solution, and in this case, we we need to add uh, an extra term to the free form uh, Raman Raman. So in this case, uh, the, uh, for this solution, the warp factor were given by this H five five uh, the the subindex five is because this is induced by the five brains in the as we will see. So in this case, this warp factor depends on two constants, B1 and B2. So if these both of these constants are positive, we see that this is a brain warp factor. So the metric behaves like a brain in, in, in R uh, close to zero. Uh, but if we consider another possibility the of the constants, if we choose the B1 to be negative and B2 to be positive, we get that um, near the origin, uh, the the behavior is that of a deep brain, but near this uh, particular combination are equal uh, square root of minus b2 over v1. We found a, a no plane behavior, so the dilaton and the curvature diverges, and beyond that point the metric becomes imaginary. So what wha what happens is that we we are starting not with a compact calabial, so. We are considering uh, R4 that is non-compact, but the warp factor uh, effectively bounds his space. So what we find is that we, ha we have compact solutions starting from a non-compact base Calabial. Um, 
so now this space will be an interval times uh, an, a three sphere. And we find that this solution preserves uh, half the as many supersymmetries as the unwarped one, as the original one. So we get n equal 4,0 supersymmetry. Uh, flux quantization gives conditions on, on on the fluxes. Now we have an extra piece because F3 not, now depends on the volume of the second to a sphere that is uh, the sphere that appears in the metric of R4 in polar coordinates. So we get three conditions instead of just two. So this amounts to fixing the, content, the constants in some way. Um, so the charges of the of the of these objects that, that appear, this O5 and D5, are given in this way. Uh, so what we find is the the solution has in this interval that it was compactified by the warp factor. Uh, at the two extremes, we we get different behaviors, but uh, supergravity cannot distinguish between the two two situations. So we could have in the in R equals zero a single D brain and in the other right end point an O5 plane that is just the behavior that we found. But we could uh, have uh, a stack of two D5 brains on top of the o uh, an O5 plane at R0. These have the behavior of a D brain. Uh, and uh, the other end point an O5 plane. So in this later case we have two O5 planes. So in the Calabia we, we get two points that are Calabiao is just R4 in this case, uh, uh, compactified, and um, we get uh, that we can interpret this warp R4 as a quotient of a force spear by this involution. This involution uh, get has two fixed points, and in these two fixed points serve as loci for these two o, o planes that we're finding. So in this interpretation, since the internal space comes from a, co a quotient of a compact space, uh, we can impose char we, we need to impose char charge conservation, and uh, we can cancel the presence of the two O5 planes by introducing two D brains. So and these two D brains we put uh, on the origin. So the Yeah, so uh, I will comment about the string theory by the end of the talk. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the only thing is that w we can m more or less make contact of the situation where there is only one O5 plane, so we don't know yet uh, which string theory realization could give two O5 uh, planes at, at the end points. But yeah, supergravity, if you see the behavior of the metric around this, it, uh, it, it cannot make a difference these two cases. So, well, this, this fixes uh, entirely the, the relations between the constants uh, of our background. So now we can uh, extend this to more general cases. If we consider a warped Calabiao in general, we need to impose this uh, equation for the warp factor. So the warp factor of is a Laplace equation uh, in the internal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be before you looked at the spectrum, the behavior of the geometry is, is indistinguishable, but yeah, the spectrum will be different. You get different, uh, uh, you get fluctuations of the deep brain, so you can, you have a more general, like effective Lagrangian. Yeah, that's right. So th this relation will be important. Um, this Laplacian of H5, Laplacian of the warp factor being zero, comes from imposing Bianchi identity from more than three from flux, and this will we need to impose this as we further generalize uh, our backgrounds. So the more general flux, flux here will involve the Hodge dual of the differential of the warp factor. So this solution has an internal piece, that's the warp product space. But now we want to consider more general seven manifolds that are not just the product in this case warp, but a product of a sphere and Calabiao. And we will do this by vibrating. So, so first, uh, uh, it will be convenient to, to see how S3 can be described 
a soft vibration, vibration of a of a two sphere uh, with fibers being a uh, circle as one. So the vibration would be a non-trivial generalization of a product space, something like that. Uh, so locally, it it's just a product manifold, but uh, globally you have uh, something non-trivial. So the circles are parameterized by a coordinate that we call psi, and uh, the vibration is mediated by a connection, and this connection will be a one form. So the one form eta will um, satisfy this relation that d eta is the volume form of the S2 base manifold. So with this description, the metric on S3 can be written in this form. So we get always this d psi plus the one form eta on the base manifold. And the volume form of S3 can be written also in terms of this particular combination. So a further generalization that we will make is we now take the three sphere to be non-trivially fibered over the Calabial two. So these solutions, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, were found uh, indirectly by solving supersymmetric conditions for type 2A backgrounds with SU2 structure and uh, then T-dualizing over one of the coordinates. So we get uh, type 2B. Uh, this vibration is mediated by an extra one form. Now this one form would be on the Calabial. And the field strength of the of this one form must be anti self dual in order to supersymmetry be preserved. So supersymmetric conditions impose that F is anti self dual. So now uh, what we get is that if we shift the combination deep psi plus eta with this extra one form that l lives in the internal Calabial. We, we get uh, a new solution. And this solution requires a, a further modification of the uh, Ramon Ramon 3 form by this object. Um, and the condition on the warp factor that will be the Laplacian being zero is, is further modified. Um, so as in the case of the initial, initial warp R4, we we get to consider non-compact calabials as long as the warp factor induces somehow uh, the appearance of sources that will bound your space. So the warp factor will I induce the so the warp factor will uh, effectively bound the space through sources. So we need to to discuss how sources modify the background, and this means that we we need to to modify our our condition coming from the the Bianca identity of Ramon, Ramon 3 form by including these uh, local terms in the right hand side of the equation. So here y, i are the positions of the sources on the Calabio 2. Uh, the sources can be in general a stack of the five brains, a single of five plane, or could be a coincident combination of these two, taking into account that all planes doesn't don't stack. So now we'll let's discuss a little bit uh, what would be a non the non-triple vibration. So the the Calabi-Yau twofold can be defined in general in terms of three self-dual two forms. These self-dual two forms would be basically the real components of the holomorphic uh, two form on the calabi and uh, the Kähler form. So these obese these relations. So these two forms are closed. And anti self duality of F that uh, is required in order to preserve supersymmetry is equivalent to these relations that these JIs which the field strength uh, is zero. So if we choose a local orthonormal frame where the self dual two forms are given in, in terms of these expressions, we get that we can satisfy anti self duality of the field strength if we write this uh, f in terms of three functions. So f depends on three functions, and choosing three functions, we can find a solution uh, of the type to be supergravity. But this only happens if, if we impose that df equals zero, because f is just the exterior differential of this one for mediating the vibration over the clavial. So this imposes conditions on which f, f which functions defining the 
anti self dual to form R. So if Calabiao is locally R4 and uh, we choose this canonical frame to be just the uh, dxm, this is equivalent to solving a system of four partial differential equations that uh, per implies that these three functions are harmonic, but are actually they're more constringent. But uh, for finding solutions with non-trivial fibration, it is enough to, chose to choose this F1, F2, F3 to be constants. So choosing them, them to be constants already gives some interesting examples. And the simplest examples would be taking the Calabia to just R4, as we did in the warp, in the simplest warp uh, case, or globally T4. So we will focus on the first uh, possibility. So uh, the globally R4, I mean, just I four R4, four we can describe in terms of polar coordinates, but this, this time it's convenient to describe the, the sphere, the three sphere in terms of as u to a left in four and one form. So we, we, we get uh, the vibration mediated by this one form to be in this, uh, in the, in this uh, expression. So now the warping of is uh, a modified condition but in the left-hand side, the modification of the Laplacian is just a constant, and the constant given by this, uh, well, here C1, C2, and C3 are constants, so uh, the cal C is a constant also. So ne we need to solve this equation in order to, to find solutions. So if we assume that the warp factor respects the isometries of the sphere spanned by LA, th so this is sphere in, in inside the Calabial, so the solutions for H5 take this form. So we see we, we get A1 plus A2 over R squared. That was the warp factor of our in simplest case without vibration. And the vibration modifies the, the form of the warp factor by this con this this term uh, that contains the calligraphic C. So fixing cal C to zero, we recover the R4 solution with trivial vibration, the warp R4 solu R4 solution. And if we consider uh, this non-trivial non vibration, then we see that the warp factor admits four zeros. And in fact, if we tune properly A1 and A2, we can produce two situations. So these two situations um, involve the behavior of a D5 brain over in on R equals zero, and an O5 brain on the other end of the interval, or two of O5 uh, plane behaviors at the endpoints of the interval. So in this case, uh, we get that in the first case, we, we get an that the radial coordinate of the polar representation of R4 is bounded between zero and this constant B2. And in the other case, we get uh, that is bounded between some positive uh, B1 and B2. So we will analyze these cases separately. So the behavior of the D5 brain in this first case uh, uh, happens at R equals zero, and we have a no five plane behavior at the other end point of the interval. But uh, this is similar to the warp R4, but uh, this time the, uh, the spheres are non-trivially fibered. So the form the form flux uh, gets more terms with respect to to the trivial vibration, and this mod modifies the flux quantization conditions that we found in the warp, the warp R4 case. So this is, this is again fixes the constants appropriately. Um, the so we can again uh, interpret this solution as being uh, just the f the four sphere with this involution that gives you two O5 planes. But in this case, uh, there's a problem because, so the non-trivial warping modifies uh, the condition of the conservation of charges. So now the conservation of charges means that the sum of all the charges from the sources is not zero, but is this shifting by the, by the vibration. And since the left-hand side is strictly positive and we have two O5 planes, we can have at most one d-brain at r equals zero. If we have two d-brains, then it, this would be zero, and 
this implies that the fabrication is trivial. So we get uh, another condition. Um, so in the case of the O5, O5 uh, behavior in the endpoints, um, we get uh, different uh, flux quantization conditions. And again, we can consider the interpretation of, us of an S4 oriented folded by this involution. But now it's not longer possible to put the brains on the ends of the interval because a deep brain would change the behavior to that of a uh, deep brain behavior, even if you have all five planes. So we have to tune differently the the constants. So there is an interpolating case here. Uh, if we see how the warp factor can be described in these two dif physically different situations, if we set B one to zero, the warp factor is is the same for both cases. So actually, we have this B1 squared. Uh, we can see as being a parameter that interpolates bec between these two cases. So if B1 squ squared is positive, we get the D505 behavior. And if it's negative, we have an O505 behavior. And if it's zero, this interval will, will have a regular zero and an O5 behavior of at that point. So, so this interpolating case is just p1 equals zero. So now we would like to consider, in principle, non-trivial, non-compact Calabias, not just R4 and and uh, yeah, not just uh, R4. Uh, so it is useful to restrict to Calabias containing a U1 isometry. So what we found is that uh, there are two places, two two possibilities. So in one case, we, we get U1 vibrations over R3, over the three plane. And in the other case, we get U1 vibrations governed by the, by the Todd equation. So uh, actually, both cases are converted, governed by a sim single PDE. And in the first case, it reduces to the Laplace equation instead of Todd one. But uh, I, I will not uh, discuss this further, because I'm, I'm, I want to, to analyze the R4 the R4 warped and fibered uh, case. So now we we want in principle to see if there is a dual CFT of this of this new family of solutions. So in principle, the dream would be to compute the spectrum of strings of this background. This is just not possible. Uh, but but I mean the technology we have now. So uh, a more modest goal would be to determine the spectrum of light operators in supergravity regime. This would be the computation of the Kaluza-Klein spectrum. And there is one uh, more recent tool that is called KK spectrometry. Uh, this uses exceptional field theory in and were uh, developed for some situations that uh, unfortunately doesn't hold for our types of solution. So uh, so first step, we would just look at some universal modes, some modes, so w w some modes that uh, are simpler, behave behave simpler, in a simpler way, um, and we just linearly perturb the type to be equations of motion around our backgrounds, and 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 we look for these particular universal modes. So first, uh, we would like to analyze the spin to. Uh, fluctuations. So uh, there is a universal equation for a spin to fluctuations on maximally symmetric spaces embedded into type 2b. This was found in 2011. So this works for a metric that is just a warp metric. So we get uh, a warp factor depending on the internal coordinates. And this works also for a particular ansatz of the metric fluctuation. So in this ansatz we get that the off diagonal and the internal pieces of the metric are set to zero. If we choose this ansatz, w one can argue that, uh, I mean, one, one can show that is in general, the uh, spin to fluctuations on the external space satisfies the laplace bertram equation. So this equation contains only the information of the metric, the background metric, and not, for example, uh, the information of all other background fields uh, that appears, for example, the the fluxes, the Roman Roman fluxes, or, or other stuff. So, in in this equation, we can make the separation of 
coordinates. So we take that uh, we have transverse traceless fluctuations. And uh, these fluctuations uh, satisfies this equation 12. And uh, given that we describe properly these uh, fluctuations on the external space, then the internal piece of, of our field will uh, satisfy this equation 13. This comes from, from, from this laplace bertrami by separating variables. And the masses of the states are given by the via an eigenvalue problem on this uh, internal equation. So we want to solve this. Um, but actually, there, there is a different answer that we could make that is uh, a bit more general. So in for backgrounds of this type, that our family of solutions of E, the, this has a dilaton that depends only on the internal uh, piece of the manifold. And for F3 Ramon Ramon fluxes, that c contains no mixing uh, components uh, with respect to the external and internal space, as given in this equation. We can do better, and we consider uh, an answer that describes the spin one fluctuations of the metric. So we get uh, that only we, we need for this answer to make only the internal g i j to to be zero. But uh, now the argument from Bacchus and SS does not hold anymore because this was only for the particular answer where the h mu nu is the only non-zero piece. But uh, by explicit computation of the linear perturbations, we found that these spin two fluctuations decouple and satisfy the universal equation as long as we get this uh, equation for this relation 14 being satisfied. So this A is the warp factor. So we see that we can uh, satisfy this if we require that no fluctuations uh, exist along the directions in which A have support. So if we just assume this, w we get that we, we can uh, describe the spin to fluctuations. We will see from a, a, a string theory analysis that, that maybe that's too, too strong a, a statement to say, but uh, we will see that we expect that H mu i to be uh, trivial along this uh, along the directions in which A have support. So we describe this H mu I that is a spin that are spin one fluctuations by the proc equation. And again, we separate variables uh, in our the equations coming from the linearly perturbed type to B equations of motion. And we find some conditions on the internal space that we need to solve in order to get the spectrum of spin one. So now, further imposing transversality in the internal directions, because this is being one of its transversality in the external ones, uh, this makes the Dilaton Einstein and F3, F3 equations almost to the couple. Uh, we see that it's almost to the couple because if we just consider these ansatz and no other fluctuation, we see that there, there is some inconsistency in the equations for h mu i. So this being one coming from the, the fluctuations of the graviton. So in order to get a, a consistent set of equations, we need to consider non-trivial fluctuations also of the Ramon-Ramon to form potential. So we get these minimal ansatz that uh, give consistent equations. So we get a, an extra spin one fluctuation in, the, in, this, in this setting. Uh, this uh, spin one uh, is also transverse in the internal and uh, external and internal spaces, and we get a couple of a couple equations actually for H and A. We saw that we, we, we showed that these couple of equations can be diagonalized as long as this condition is satisfied. So uh, f uh, this relation between the warp factor and the dilaton should be constant. And this is satisfied by our family of backgrounds, so we get nice uh, equations for a spin two and a spin one fluctuations. So uh, all this was said, but we need to discuss the presence of sources that because the work factor induces these deep brain nanoplanes. So these sources will back react on the background. 
please? Yes, actually for uh, maximally symmetric spaces uh, with at least n equal ones per symmetry, we found that this should be satisfied for the unwarped uh, geometries. Yeah. yeah. So we need to consider the effect of the sources uh, on the fluctuated equations of motion, so we'll need to modify uh, them and, and see if our spin two and spin one equations actually decoupled when we modified the equations by the presence of sources. So we need to perform an, an, a more general analysis, including uh, the DBI and, and, and West amino actions of whatever sources are present. And uh, it was shown, that this will come in a forthcoming paper, uh, that uh, precisely for these modes of spin two and spin one, even including the all the terms of the Lagrangian, uh, because of the sources, these fluctuations uh, decouple, so they they don't be don't get affected by the sources. So the internal equation that came, I will focus now on just on the spin two, but we did uh, an analysis for the spin one fluctuations also. So the spin two uh, for backgrounds with trivial fibration turns out to satisfy this equation. So we get a sum of two Laplacians, but uh, actually there is a factor, a prefactor depending on the warp, of the warping. So we need to solve this for particular cases, obviously. And uh, in case of non-trivial vibration, then the equation is uh, modified by a few terms. So in terms of just the Laplacian on the Calabia, we get terms that depend on the vibration one form. So. So this is now uh, for cases where the vibration is essentially over an interval. So we get a more simpler uh, situation. So our one form depends effectively only on the coordinate over the interval and not on all coordinates of the Calabial. The internal equation becomes uh, a strongly over problem, and uh, we can then uh, solve try to solve this, this equation. In this um, 19, we get we get actually H L1, L2 that comes from the expansion of the internal piece, um, the harmonic expansion with respect to two spheres, the sphere, the original S3 sphere that co accompanies the ADS3, and the sphere that uh, lives inside the Calabial. So we need to, to solve this. Now, uh, for the strong level problem, we need to impose boundary conditions. And um, the, the problem with boundary conditions, when you have sources, is that close to these sources, the supergravity description breaks down. So uh, what we will see is that we can choose Neumann or Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions mostly based on regularity and normalizability of fluctuations. So we'll see that our differential equation has solution that behaves well. Uh, and, and this will allow us to, s to, de to decide which boundary conditions we choose. So for example, for the warp R4 uh, without vibration, what we find is that uh, we get these eigenvalues. Um, so positivity of beta squared, the this beta squared in appearing in the strong level problem, uh, is just the same as the BPS bound of n equal 4,0 super conformal algebra. So this is consistent with the fact that our theory of is this, this has this, this supersymmetric structure. And uh, we see here that beta squared is independent of L2, that will be the, the spin of the S2 the of the second two sphere, sorry, the second three sphere. So this appears to give an infinite degeneracy because for any value of L2 we get uh, we, we get a state. But uh, actually we need to analyze the behavior of the solutions at the end at the endpoints, and this will restrict what are the the possible uh, allowed allowed states. So in ge the general solution for this case is gives in is given in terms of Brussel functions. And uh, the analysis shows that the only regular normalizable solutions satisfying admissible boundary conditions are the constant functions. So this, con this situation happens only when beta is equal to the spin of the second sphere equal to zero. 
so we, do, we don't get degeneracy. And the uh, transfer trace the spin to fluctuations gives rise only to BPS states. Uh, so the the lower state here will be dual to the stress energy tensor or we expect and uh, also in this equation there is a cut uh, where the solution becomes infinitely oscillating and above this this value uh, all solutions are no non normalizable so we will we will get a spectrum and above some cut we cannot get any solution uh, so now we consider vibration over R4. We perform again an expansion on internal function in terms of scalar spherical harmonics. Uh, now we get uh, this left and right. Uh, so are the quantum numbers corresponding to the SU2 left and SU2 right. That uh, is just the isometry of the three sphere. In doing this for both spheres, we, we have the modes uh, given in 21. So now the vibration breaks the symmetry of the first uh, sphere down to as u two l times u one. So this uh, breaking of symmetry is so in in the equations because the operator, the differential operator with respect to the coordinate of the fibers, uh, appears uh, breaking the the symmetry of S three. So there is also a term which contains the lead derivative with respect to the one form. Uh, mediating the vibration and this uh, lead derivative is expanded in terms of right invariant killing vectors all this I said because uh, this will induce the appearance of of the quantum numbers m1 and m2 uh, in the coefficients of the internal equation so now we need to to see uh, a fine structure here so the equations are not diagonal in general for this non-trivially vibrated case so this will uh, imply that well, this will uh, complicate the analysis but we can just uh, stick to the cases where equations are still diagonal so we see that for modes with uh, the second quantum number equal to zero uh, the bps states appear only when m1 r is zero the, P the bps bound is saturated as we expect um, so in, in this analysis, we need to consider the two cases separately. So we have the D505 uh, behavior and the no 505 behavior. We know that these two cases interpolate at a solution with a regular zero in in instead of D brain or plane. And uh, this happens at B1 uh, squared equal to zero. This is we just choose this as the parameter. And this is a result of this the first uh, BPS, sorry, the first states for some choosing of, of quantum numbers, of a specific quantum numbers. So what we see is that when, when the parameter A is positive, we are in the D505 uh, case. So this shaded region is precisely the region where uh, the, the solutions are non-normalizable. So what we see is that we we get uh, some bounded discrete spectrum. Now in the O505 case, we don't have this uh, shaded region, so there is an infinite uh, spectrum that uh, that is still discrete. So in the case of M1 equals zero for L2 equals zero, we get an extra uh, line that will be the BPS spectrum. So in this fir first figure, we have uh, BPS. We have BPS states, and in the other ones, we get just non-BPS. So now I'll just comment a little bit on what would be the string theory that are related to these solutions. So the presence of all five planes uh, around these points in, in Calabiao. Uh, means that we require to perform an or oriented for projection on the what would be the type to be string theory uh, leading to these solutions. So these projections involve uh, an operation as, as as is well known both on the wall sheet and the target space. The oriented for group is in general of this form. So we have G1 that is just some discrete asymmetry on the target space and we have G2 that should be an evolution of the target space. And this omega w is the parity transformation of the wall sheet, under which 
G, uh, the metric, the dilaton, and the two form Roman Roman potential are even, and uh, the Neville Schwartz, Neville Schwartz, the axion, and the four form Roman Roman potential are odd. So these O planes are fixed uh, loci of the elements of this group in general. So in our solutions, there are no O9 planes. So this means that we cannot get just. Uh, as an element of the oriented fault, the worship parity operator, because this has a uh, trivial effect on the target space. So this would require just uh, all points are fixed points. So we see that uh, we only get to to have a non-trivial uh, element in the, in the in the second factor that would be a combination of the worship parity operator and some involution of the Calabio 2. Locally, we can take 23, that is just this inversion. And uh, for example, with respect to 23, a torus would have 16 fixed points located at uh, A equals 0 or pi r. So if we take this torus and we make the limit where the radius becomes infinite, the torus is decompactified and we get an R4, and this R4 gets only one fixed point at the origin. So instead of directly dealing with oriented folds of, comp of complicated backgrounds, like uh, this 3 times this 3, and, uh, we could uh, just analyze the oriented fold of the string compactification to six dimensions before reducing to the ADS3 vacuum. So we could uh, just try that. Then after we, s we sit this compactification, we can perform the corresponding IK compactification on S3 and at the low energy limit. So for the torus and the oriented fold group that, uh, that w I described before, we can actually deduce the projected spectrum uh, to six dimension using, for example, the RNS formalism. So the 10 dimensional indices break into M that goes from this the runs over the six external dimensions and I would be the directions this time on the Calabial. And we just find the behavior of all the worship fields under this uh, combination of parity and involution. And this is the projected spectrum that we found. So in the NS sector, the surviving states are just the dilaton. Uh, the metric in the internal directions, in the Calabial directions, and uh, BMI would be um, uh, the Nevesho Neve Schwarz to form with one direction external and one internal. And so this is the spectrum. The surviving states for this oriented for projections are 17 scalars, eight vectors, one antisymmetric tensor, and metric. And this is precisely the content of n equal 1, comma 1, d equal 6 supergravity coupled to four vector multiplets. When we perform the the three sphere reduction of this uh, theory, we know that we get n equal 4 comma 0 uh, in ADS3. So the oriented for reduced supersymmetry initially from 32 supercharges to 16, the S3 reduction reduces further to 8 supercharges and giving precisely this n equal 4 comma 0. Um, the straight projected out by the parent type to be on T4 must be absent, absent from the supergravity analysis. So their fluctuations we can set to zero. And um, so notice that the Ramon Ramon to form potential is not projected out. Uh, is, is it even under the oriented fault? So uh, this is good uh, because this will contain the vector that will give rise to the spin one fluctuation that is required for the consistency of the spin one equations, as w I mentioned before. And another thing that we see is that GMI is projected out. And uh, this is precisely the spin one fluctuations with uh, fluctuation with this internal direction in terms of the Calabria that is the support of the six five, that is the support of the warp factor. So we get uh, that r the relation required for the spin to fluctuations to decouple are precisely satisfied by this background. Um, so a few more comments. So taking the R to infinity limit, 
a uh, continuum appears uh, if we start from the torus so uh, it's, it's well known that uh, there is a massive spectrum due to the appearance of internal momenta so the corresponding massive states become massless while winded, winded, winding uh, states acquire infinite mass and we get this the we recover the three-dimensional theory so the theory becomes effectively ten-dimensional but the projection ske sketched before is still valid it's just um, we, we don't have an interpretation of a six-dimensional theory. We just get, uh, but we can still break the indices and, and, and see which components are su survive the oriented for projection. So the question would be: Could the compactification induced by the warping lift this continuum and allow us to make contact with the simplest R4 warp solution? So could the warping uh, uh allow us to make sense of, of the of this uh, the compactification limit so now the single O5 plane case seems naturally here because the compactification limit of the torus gives just one fixed point that where the oriented for plane will live but uh, we, we couldn't find uh, which scenario will give two O5 planes so it, this seems uh, to be uh, more non-trivial. So th these cases from the string theory th it seems to arise from different scenarios. So string theory differentiates between these two situations more evidently than the supergravity uh, limit. So I'll just uh, conclude by summarizing actually. So we did an analysis of the new ADS3 Supergravity solutions preserving a small n equal 4,0 superconformal symmetry. The new features here were warped space time and no trivial vibration of the three sphere over the internal Calabi-L4 manifold. In general, this warping in the was induced by sources. Uh, the appears the brains are no planes that can bound an otherwise non-compact space, non-compact space. We found some concrete realizations, as well as defining equations for more complicated non-compact Calabi-Yaus with spherical vibrations. We found some universal states in the spectrum, uh, spin 2 and spin 1, belonging to BPS branches, as well as the presence of non-BPS branches for non-trivial vibration. Uh, these modes decouple from the rest of the system, as long as F3 is the only non-trivial flux. Actually, we showed this for, for more general cases. This will this will appear in a for forthcoming work. So we were allowed, uh, we, we were able to to show this in, in a very general setting. So these results are in accordance with the oriented fault of a simple torus string theory compactification. And uh, that that would be all. Thank you. So it will be different if you start from Torus or Calabia, but the ADS3, the, the stress field reduction to ADS3 will put those in both sides. But for the analysis of the modes that you presented before, uh, you can all, can all be organized in terms of the 60 theory? Is that, I mean, you said the m uh, modes match, but can we match it at the level of equations of motion? Yeah, th we hope to, to, to do that analysis. So just to consider the zero modes coming from the Calabial, so we get the content of the 6D theory. So mm. if we got K3, we, we know that we have these 21 tensor multiplets, and, and then we can perform the reduction and, the and supergravity. We, we, we will try we're trying to do that analysis okay. at the level of supergravity equations of motion. Okay. questions if not let's thank Luis again
So in past few years, there has been a lot of efforts to obtain the uh, flat space S matrices involving scalar and gauge fields from ADS. And also some analytic properties of S matrices have been studied using ADS-CFT correspondence in flat limit. Uh, there has also been efforts to understand soft theorems from the flat limit of ADS and there are also progresses towards understanding flat space asymptotic symmetries using the flat limit of ADS. And recently there were also some works to understand IR finiteness of S matrix uh, using ADS CFT. Um, and in this particular work our focus will be on obtaining some perturbative amplitudes in flat space from ADS CFT. Uh, perspective and more specifically we shall consider the higher spinning massive fields and show how to recover the amplitudes involving these massive fields in flat space from ADS. Due to the holographic principle it means relating flat space S matrix in d plus 1 dimension to d dimensional conformal field theory and for this we shall make use of the momentum space CFTs as opposed to the position space which is most commonly used for studying uh, conformal field theories. So let me mention two motivation for this work. So first we want to see how the S matrix involving massive fields is encoded in CFT correlators. Now the uh, higher spinning massive fields are very important in any theory of quantum gravity and it turns out that any higher derivative correction to three point function of gravitons it must be accompanied by an infinite tower of higher spinning massive particles. This is the well known work by uh, CEMZ and hence it is important to know the existence of consistent higher spinning theories in flat space. In uh, So, we cannot have like uh, any um, uh, consistent uh, theory of uh, higher spinning uh, massless particles. Uh, if you have uh, lambda non-zero, so in ADS there are this uh, famous Vasilev theory, but in flat space it is not pos possible. But if you have like massive higher spinning particle, you can have a non-trivial S matrix. But there is uh, apart from string theory, there is no uh, uh, known example of these theories and it is an active area of research. Um, our second goal is to derive the gyromagnetic ratio of uh, massive spinning fields in flat space using ADS CFT correspondence. So let me uh, introduce this topic. So the gyromagnetic ratio as you all know is a physical quantity of significant interest for a charged particles and historically it played an important role in the development of quantum mechanics and QFT. It arises whenever we have rotating charged particles and so these particles have angular momentum and create a magnetic dipole field and the gyromagnetic ratio is defined as the ratio between the magnetic dipole moment of a particle to its angular momentum. Uh, so L is the angular momentum, mu is the uh, dipole moment and gamma is the uh, gyromagnetic ratio. So for example, if you have a classical charged particle which is rotating about its axis of symmetry, the gyromagnetic ratio is given by this well known uh, expression. And similarly, an isolated electron has an angular momentum and a magnetic uh, moment which results from a spin and its gyromagnetic ratio is given by this expression uh, and this factor G is called the gyromagnetic factor and its tree level value predicted from Dirac equation is 2. In general, the gyromagnetic uh, couplings can be defined, uh, this uh, gyromagnetic ratios can be defined as the coupling between massive charge fields and the gauge fields. In a general field theory, at the lowest derivative order, we can write two types of couplings between the gauge field and the massive field. So first is the minimal coupling which is introduced uh, uh, by uh, uh, when you promote a ordinary theory to a gauge theory. Um, so in this, uh, the first term, first term here, so this is, uh, this, this is uh, due to the minimal uh, coupling procedure. But then you can also write a gauge invariant uh, 
uh, combination uh, at the lowest derivative order itself. So, f mu nu has one derivative. So, uh, this coupling is also possible and but so, phi mu can be any uh, arbitrary uh, spinning field. Uh, so, it can be vector spin 2, spin 3, uh, massive field and so on. Um, and uh, alpha is the gyromagnetic ratio, q is the charge. Uh, so, uh, so, what I was saying was, uh, so, uh, the minimal co coefficient in the minimal coupling is uh, fixed. But the coefficient of this term f mu nu uh, phi mu phi nu because this coupling is allowed uh, its ratio is not fixed and the ambiguity is what is uh, called this gyromagnetic ratio. So, one can define the gyromagnetic uh, factor uh, as alpha over q and tree level unitarity in field theory and string theory implies the value of g to be 2. Uh, and there are also some exceptions to this value. For example, if you have some Kaluja Klein BPS state, uh, its value turns out to be 1. Uh, and one of our goals here is to probe what ADS CFT implies for it, this value. Uh, Sorry, could you explain this, uh, so, so, essentially, so when you have like uh, so, the first term here is the, uh, it, it, it is coming from uh, minimal coupling, right, this and then you have this coupling f mu nu phi star mu phi nu. Um, so, the first, the uh, coefficient in the first coupling is fixed from group theory. Uh, second term is allowed, what you could do is you could integrate by part the derivative in f mu nu and it will become proportional to the first term. Uh, but uh, since this coupling was allowed to begin with uh, in terms of the field strength, uh, we need to keep this in our like uh, effective action and uh, but its ratio compare it is like a coefficient relative to the minimal coupling that a priori we do not know. So, that is what I mean uh, one needs to fix uh, in general. And Dirac equation, for example, it fixes its uh, its value to be two. And then, in general, uh, Weinberg showed that uh, using uh, some analysis of unitarity, um, that its value should be two. And there are also some studies in string theory in ten dimension that its value should be two. Uh, but this is not always true. Uh, there are some like Kaluza-Klein states uh, which have value one. Uh, yeah. So, essentially uh, to prove uh, the value g equal to 2, what uh, Weinberg assumed was the energy was between um, say max Planck and E over m. But then if you have like this Kaluja Klein BPS state, E over m is like order 1 and then uh, that proof breaks down. Uh. <coughs> Phi and yeah, yeah, mu s. Yeah, so I, I, so it's a very schematic. I have not uh, like I have not written. I mean, yeah, it's a most. I mean, it's a general spinning field. Uh, if you have like a, a spinner, uh, then uh, the this uh, 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 the index in f mu nu will be contracted with gamma mu nu. So usually you need some index. Uh, so, it, it would not be there for like a scalar field, but you so, but for a like a spinning field it should be there, I mean this coupling is there. Sir, if you let us say you know like if I take such a theory where uh, the uh, uh, I have some massive field coupled to uh, 3D. I think uh, uh, I uh, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but is not it what uh, these people who are doing this uh, 
uh, anomalous G factor uh, trying to do uh, this anomalous magnetic moment uh, uh, So uh, our study will be at tree level, but okay, if you consider it loops and uh, loop corrections and so on, then. Uh, yeah, I was not talking about anomalous magnetic. Yeah. I was talking about the correction to the photon. No. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, ah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah, we can discuss. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, Yeah, so the minimal is, I mean, usually when you uh, replace ordinary derivative by covariant derivative. And they are the, like, uh, when you introduce this del mu minus i e a mu. So this i e a mu is fixed from group theory. Uh, but this, uh, this non-minimal, the reason we are calling it non-minimal is because uh, this term could have been absent. Uh, but because it is gauge invariant, so we have to allow this uh, term at this order. Uh, so, uh, no, no. So, the minimal, when we say, okay, I think it is a historical terminology. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is a. But how do you fix like this ratio there? Uh, I mean, this, of course, if we do integration by part in the like, exactly. uh, so no, it becomes. Does it give that term? Yeah. Because it come with a plus sign. Yeah. No, but from there you can only fix the structure, right? Yeah, you only fix the structure. But not the like not coefficient. Not yeah. Uh. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, oh, in the first term, actually, I have um, not written the e explicit indices in the minimal term, but it's there. I mean, uh, it's a dot. It's a dot yeah, this uh, dot. Yeah, it's a like contracted. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, Which one? No, no, no. Yeah. The, they both have, have like one derivative. Uh, yeah. 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 Same order. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, but I think Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It appears to me that term will come into the minimum. If you start with the grand, just start with three point coupling, you would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And you have to do great to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, so one of our goals is to prove uh, in uh, this question. Uh, so let me begin with, uh, uh, so my brief outline of my talk is, uh, so I will talk about some, uh, uh, so we want to compute some correlator. So first I will talk about this correlator just from the CFT perspective. Uh, then I will talk about a bulk ADS theory, uh, which will give rise to this kind of correlator. And then I will study its flat limit. Uh, let me begin with the boundary CFT story in momentum space. So just to set the stage, uh, I think it's very basic, but let me just mention it anyway. So uh, in flat space, uh, we know conformal transformations are given by uh, this transformation. We have Lorentz translation, scaling, and special conformal transformation. And the dynamical data which governs the behavior of a field under the scaling uh, is the conformal dimension of operator and it governs the uh, two-point function of the field phi. So A is the uh, constant, some constant, and delta is the uh, conformal dimension. 
The other dynamical data is contained in the three point function, uh, so it's also fixed completely from conformal symmetry and C123 is some, uh, it's called OPE coefficient. And in general, the form of an endpoint correlator is heavily constrained by conformal invariance. So, for example, for n scalar operators, its form is fixed to be uh, uh, this. So, here in this expression, uh, uh, OIs are operators, and then we have product over xi minus xj to the power 2 alpha ij, and then we have uh, some function f of u. u is the uh, u is the conformal cross ratio given by this bottom expression. And uh, delta i, the conformal dimension of the operator are related to this alpha ij by uh, this relation. Delta i is minus sum over alpha ij and where alpha ij are symmetric and alpha ij is 0. <coughs> so this is just from uh, <coughs> uh, conformal uh, symmetry. Uh, so during last few decades, uh, the study of conformal symmetry has become indispensable in many areas such as condensed matter, high energy and cosmology. Let me uh, consider one example which is very interesting and it will be uh, uh, like, we will be considering CFT in momentum space and uh, it will be interesting to see where uh, that analysis can be applied. So, in the uh, so it's an example from cosmology. So, inflationary phase in early universe, uh, as we all know, it can be approximated by d sitter at the leading order. So, this is the metric of d sitter d s square is minus d t square plus e to the power two s t uh, d x square, and uh, by a simple uh, transformation uh, t to e to the power minus s tau, it can be written in this form. So. It's just the Penrose diagram of uh, digital space. So tau equal to zero is the end. So this is uh, this thing. Now what happens is the this universe at the end of inflation uh, can be thought as the future infinity of a digital space. So this tau equal to zero uh, uh, line can be thought as the end of the inflation. But it turns out that the isometries of digital space give rise to conformal symmetry on its future infinity. Uh -huh. And this means that we can study the state of the universe at the end of inflation by conformal symmetry at the leading order. Uh, so this is one context where conformal symmetry has been useful. Um, and the study of conformal symmetry, uh, conformal correlators uh, is traditionally done in position space. And momentum space is not a very natural language for CFTs. And the reason is not uh, difficult to see. Because usually when you consider uh, momentum space, the decomposition of a function is in terms of sinusoidal function. Uh, but for a conformal uh, field theory, for a conformal operator, you want the decomposition in terms of uh, modes which have nice uh, uh, transformation under scaling. Which uh, these, uh, if you decompose in terms of like sinusoidal mode, they won't have like nice transformation properties. Uh, but in, a, in spite of this, uh, during last few years, there has been an in increased uh, interest in the study of conformal correlators in momentum space. And for example, an area where these correlators have turned out to be very useful is the physics of early universe cosmology. And uh, so for early universe cosmology, the quantities of physical interests are two and three point functions of primordial fluctuations. Uh, so for example, this is a cartoon. So in the like uh, inflationary phase, a lot of particles were coming in and out of the existence and this inflating universe was separating them, which later became these dense spots and became galaxies. But the correlation among these uh, 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 galaxies or dense spots at different points uh, still remain. And to measure these, uh, we need to compute two point and three point function. Uh, and the Fourier transform of these two and three point functions are these power spectrum and bi spectrum. And these are the sort of the quantities in observational projects of co W, Map, Planck, etc. And since these correlators are constrained heavily by conformal symmetries at leading order, the result of CFT correlators are needed in momentum space. Uh, and so with this in a brief introduction to this momentum space, why we need, uh, let me come to our work. So for our purpose, we shall also be using CFT correlators in momentum space. And in particular, since we are interested in massive state amplitude, we shall need the correlators involving the non conjured operators. Uh, here, we shall consider the three point from correlator in one, two is spinning non conjured operator and one conjured current. And so it turns out that momentum space CFT correlators can be systematically derived using the CFT board identities. Uh, 
So the CFT world identities in momentum space are uh, given by this. So there is uh, also Lorentz and uh, 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 translation. So translation allows us to uh, strip off our momentum conserving delta function. And so this uh, double bracket means that the uh, momentum conserving delta function has been stripped off. Uh, and then you have this uh, dilatation and the spatial conformal transformation. Um, and to determine the desired uh, correlator in momentum space, uh, we, use some, uh, we use these steps. So what we do is we want to uh, solve these uh, word identities. Uh, so what we do is uh, as a first step, we write down the most general structure for the tensors which are made out of the momentum and the metric tensor. And different tensor structures will in general be uh, multiplied with different functions of momentum. We then act with the word identity on uh, this, uh, these two word identities. And it gives rise to first and second order coupled differential equations for the unknown functions. And solving these differential equations, <coughs> we can completely fix the three point function in the momentum space. Are you fixing the dimension or you are not thinking? Uh, uh, no, so right now it's uh, general. So arbitrary dimension and uh, also the uh, di conformal dimension of delta is general. Uh, so uh, suppose we want to evaluate this three point function which is uh, our which is what we are interested in so o, o mu 1 o mu 3 are the non conserved uh, operators and j mu is a uh, conserved current these operators oi have uh, conformal dimension delta and spin 1 um, and these are non conserved uh, operators this operator uh, j mu is a conserved current and its conformal dimension is d minus 1 and is spin 1. And it satisfies the transversality uh, condition p mu j mu equal to 0. So the first step, uh, as I described, is to write a general ensemble for this, uh, this correlator using the momenta p i mu and, and the metric delta mu mu. And with some little uh, thought, one can uh, write down the most general uh, structure for uh, this, which is, uh, so we want to write down the most general structure for uh, these three indices, but there are some uh, constraint. So for example, uh, this, uh, say, mu2 index is associated to the conserved current. So we want the property that when uh, P contracts uh, this mu2 index, it should vanish. So this is what gives rise to this projector pi uh, mu2 alpha 2 in front uh, and then uh, apart from this you write down the most general structure and all these uh, coefficients are uh, which we shall call form factors a 0 0 0 a 1 0 0 etc so uh, they are arbitrary functions of the momentum what is the location of the Ah, okay, it's uh, like, um, so I have not written in the form, uh, it, okay, it's a, uh, if you, you can write it down as a sum, and then uh, that allows us to, uh, this notation allows us to express the sum in a nice manner, uh, like some A and PQ uh, kind of thing. Uh, maybe yeah, for the talk it's probably better to just use some uh, this notation, yeah. So, but it has no meaning uh, as such, I mean. Uh, uh, so here there are total nine uh, undeter I mean nine like form factors. <coughs> so uh, we so next as a next step we <coughs> act on uh, uh, these coordinate uh, this uh, structure with the word identity and it will give rise to first and second order differential equations. Uh, uh, so I have not written down the equations, uh, there are many of them, um, there are like some 28 equations. Uh, but uh, then one can solve those equations systematically. Uh, and the solution for uh, S equal to 1, so spin 1, uh, is given by uh, uh, this expression. So, so the, each of the form factor is determined up to one uh, constant. Uh, uh, which are uh, uh, written in this uh, uh, red. And then we have uh, these functions j. So let me introduce what these j's mean. Um, so this function j, uh, which had this uh, index n and then k1, k2, k3, it's an it's a integral over product of uh, triple k integrals. Uh, uh, it's called triple k integral. It's product over this modified Bessel function of the second kind. Uh, and uh, 
So this is uh, so one thing I did not mention was so these are the solutions of uh, only a second order differential equations, and uh, these there are these unfixed coefficient. But uh, this coefficient can also be fixed by using the first order uh, differential equation. So for example, if delta 1 equal to delta 3, so if the conformal dimension of the two operators, uh, non-conjured operators are same, then 6 of the coefficient get fixed in terms of the remaining one. So uh, for example, here we have chosen uh, a1, 1, 1, a1, 1, 0, and b1, 0, 1, 0. So in terms of these three, one can fix all the remaining like 6 coefficient. And so this fixes completely the uh, three-point function. Uh, And uh, this is the case in which both the uh, these uh, uh, dimensions are same. This is what will be interesting to us. Uh, so let me now go to the bulk side. We next want to see how we can recover the flat space three-point function from the CFT three-point function, uh, which we just considered. And we also want to analyze the gyromagnetic coupling. So for this, we need to connect this CFT analysis with a theory in ADS, making use of ADS CFT correspondence. We shall introduce a specific theory in the bulk, uh, some effective theory, which admits the CFT correlator, uh, which we just uh, described. So more specifically, uh, we consider a hard derivative interacting theory involving a gauge field and a massive complex. Uh, I have a question about the previous thing. So uh, is this count the number three, two equal for uh, any spin? Uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, you mean like three? Uh, so let, let us say I take a spin yeah. I take delta one. No, no. So for each spin, there are like num a different number of. Uh, so for example, if you are seven, spin two, then there are five uh, uh, independent coefficients. Uh, okay. And you drove to the spin? Yes. Uh, and uh, suppose you take two spin one, but if they jail with another operator, then uh, uh, you mean like uh, for the. Uh, no, in that case, I think it's uh, different. So, for example, even in this case, if, for example, if delta 1 is less, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in this case, if suppose delta 1 is different from delta 3, if delta 1 were different from delta 3, then instead of 3, we would have just gotten 2. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, Uh, so we shall consider this high derivative interacting theory involving a gauge field and a massive complex uh, spin 1 field. And uh, this will be described by this Lagrangian. Uh, so first term is the standard uh, einstein hilbert term uh, with cosmological constant. Uh, then we have the field strength for the uh, gauge field. Then we have the field strength for the uh, massive spin 1 field. Then it's mass term. And then we have uh, uh, this gyromagnetic term, IG alpha, FMN, uh, W star, and WN. And then we have these uh, high derivative uh, couplings. So uh, we have like, th these involve uh, the three derivatives. And then beta and gamma are the, uh, 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 these coupling constant for these high derivative terms. Uh, so we shall be working with this section. Um, the gauge field AM. Uh, is dual to a non-conjured boundary current, uh, J mu, and the massive field WM will be dual to a non-conjured CFT operator, O mu. Um, and the ideal CFT correspondence uh, implies in a standard way that the mass M of, uh, and, uh, of, mass M of this WM is related to the conformal dimension of the boundary operator, O mu, by this relation, uh, L square M square equal to delta minus 1, delta plus 1 minus T. So we can use the uh, gauge freedom to simplify our analysis. And we shall work in the axial gauge AZ equal to 0. And moreover, we shall Fourier transform the boundary directions. Uh, so if Tm is any bulk quantity, we define uh, Fourier transform of uh, uh, this in this manner. And so we can also, con uh, so uh, we consider next the classical solution of the free gauge field equations. and. Uh, this field Wm and the three point function. So, classical solution of the free gauge field is given by this expression. Uh, so, mu0 is the uh, its uh, solution, uh, mu0 is the uh, gauge field, ball gauge field, and uh, one can write down its solution, uh, one can solve and write down solution tree level in this manner. Uh, and mu will be the uh, boundary value of the this gauge field. Uh, 
so the coefficient uh, uh, this coefficient of this AMU is essentially the bottom boundary propagator. One can also write down the green function for this gauge field. Uh, so it's a bulk to bulk propagator, which is given by this. Uh, we can also write down the classical solution for the, this uh, uh, free Broca field, and it is given by this expression. And then again, here it's in terms of these Bessel functions. Uh, and then the coefficient of this W mu, it's, uh, it, is, uh, mm, it is the bulk to boundary propagator for the Broca field. Um, and the small w mu is the boundary value uh, of uh, the field. So next we want to derive the boundary three-point function involving a conserved current uh, and two, these two non-conserved uh, spin-1 operators uh, using ADS-CFT dictionary and holographic renormalization procedure. So before doing this, we note that, uh, so there is one technical point that the massive spin-1 field corresponds to an irrelevant non-conserved operator in the dual CFT. Uh, one can just do a dimensional check and see that. And the correlators of irrelevant operators have complicated singularity structures. Uh, and in the ADS-CFT correspondence, one avoids this complication by working with infinitesimal sources. Uh, so in the near boundary analysis, so essentially what this means is we shall be treating this uh, uh, WM perturbatively for holographic normalization purpose. And uh, in the near boundary analysis, we shall be working with the infinitesimal sources. And this also avoids the problem of back reaction. So the, now we can compute three-point function using ADS-CFT dictionary. Uh, and the correspondence is that the CFT generating functional uh, W of phi 0 is related to the bulk on, on shell action. Uh, it's just proportional. Uh, phi 0 denotes the boundary value of the field and acts uh, as the sources for this corresponding dual operator O mu. Um, and W of phi 0 is the generating function for all the connected diagrams in the boundary theory. So the three-point function uh, in our case will be uh, given by just differentiating uh, this uh, on-shell action with respect to uh, the boundary sources. So which were uh, small W mu and uh, small A mu. And as expected, uh, the desired three-point function takes exactly the same form as the momentum space CFT uh, three-point function we had derived earlier uh, using conformal symmetry. However, the, now the advantage is that the three arbitrary coefficient we had in our uh, CFT expression, uh, A11, A10, and B1010, uh, <coughs> now they get fixed in terms of the bulk parameter. Uh, and this is the advantage of working in momentum space. If we had worked in like position space, then it would have been very complicated to uh, relate this. Uh, uh, so alpha was alpha was this uh, gyromagnetic uh, uh, coupling, and then yeah. so alpha was this gyromagnetic uh, coefficient, and then this beta and gamma are the high derivative. Uh, Uh, by Higgsing. So you, you are thinking of uh, starting with some like uh, some massless. Uh, Let's say I start with two massless uh, UL plus UL matrices and then some uh, scalar which is charged in the boson. And then you said that. Uh, and then one combination will get these massless. Okay. And another will be the boson. Okay. High derivative, I'm not sure. Uh, how, I mean. Uh, you get all these terms. Not sure. Uh, so high derivative, I'm not sure. Maybe we do that in terms of coupling. Yeah. Then you wouldn't see all the high Yeah. Alpha at least should be. Because they will be treated as three parameters. So there's a not going to be a gauge. It's 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 not going to be a gauge. Because, because there seems to be three parameters. One is the mass, uh, uh, one is the charge. So the two char let's say I have a charge scalar field, which is charged under both you will. So we have two charges and then one bit. Mm. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering whether these three parameters are the two.
Yes, so with after this we consider okay, the how we take flat limit and how do we match uh, with the flat limit result. So let me just begin with some basics. So, uh, so for taking the flat limit of ADS, we need to send the ADS radius L to infinity. And to do this, we recall this uh, ADS metric in the Poincare coordinate, which is given by this standard expression. And to analyze the flat limit efficiently, it is convenient to parameterize the radial direction in this way. So Z over L is e to the power tau over L. So now tau runs from minus infinity to infinity, whereas Z only ran from 0 to infinity. And in the large L limit, the ADS metric becomes the flat space metric uh, up, to our, up to the correction of order 1 over L. Uh, so my notation will be mu nu in the indices are the boundary in the, uh, indices and then AB is the flat uh, space index. Uh, Uh, on the, on the oh, it's uh, one pi, but uh, you need to like uh, regulate the one pi effective action, right? So yeah. you are assuming that uh, you have like removed yeah. all the singularities. Like I was thinking from the, I don't know this position, but if you do Wittgen diagram analysis, mm -hmm. so I could have this is this is the right. So there yeah. are some loop corrections in the bulk in the GPU. Yeah, so the loop corrections are more complicated. But this corresponds to yeah. the Yes. Uh, yeah, so so ADS metric in the large L limit becomes uh, flat space metric uh, up to this correction. So we can obtain the Poincaré algebra from the ADS isometry algebra in this flat limit using the standard Inonu-Wigner contraction. So uh, in this Inonu-Wigner contraction, what one does is one takes a Lie algebra and rescales some of the uh, generators and then obtains another uh, another Lie algebra. Uh, so it's uh, nice to see how it uh, happens here. So the isometric group of Euclidean ADS d plus one is SO d plus one comma one, and it is described by this algebra. Um, and if we split that d plus two h component, this algebra uh, gives rise to these three correlators. And now, if you write uh, this m a comma d plus two, so here our notation was this capital A B C D ran from uh, like. Uh, 1, 2, 2, uh, d plus 2. So we split this into index small a and then d plus 2. So we split, uh, so a runs from just 1 to d plus 1. So if we rescale this uh, generator m a d plus 2, uh, so we write m a d plus 2 as l times p a and if we take the uh, limit l to infinity, this algebra reduces to this form uh, and with this which is exactly the standard Poincaré algebra in flat d plus 1 dimensional space. And it's also in instructive to see how we can recover the isometry transformations in flat space. So how we can relate the parameters of isometry transformations in the flat limit. So ADS isometric uh, <coughs> isometry transformations in tau comma x mu coordinates are uh, given by these expressions. So you have the Poincaré transformation for x mu, then you have scaling of x mu and translation of tau, and then you have a special con conformal transformation of tau and x mu. However, in um, in flat space, the isometry transformations take uh, these forms. So delta x mu has a standard this Poincaré transformation and delta tau as well. Uh, so omega mn uh, are the Lorentz parameter and then uh, a mu and beta are this tra uh, uh, translation parameter for x mu and uh, this tau. So we can recover the transformation, uh, these transformations from the flat limit of ADS. And more specifically, we can relate the flat parameters omega uh, mu one a mu beta to the lambda going to 1 and c mu going to 0 limit of the ADS isometry parameter. So uh, let me give one example. So for example, suppose you want to uh, 
write down translation parameter uh, for tau in flat space. So here you see that delta tau uh, involve this uh, L and uh, some parameter lambda. So to have it a finite, you are sending L to infinity. So to have it, uh, to get a finite value, you need to send uh, lambda to one so that you get a finite uh, result. So in flat space, we had this, ex for delta tau, translation of tau was uh, denoted by beta. So essentially beta will be given by uh, L, ln, lambda with the limit uh, L to infinity and lambda to one. Um, and uh, this is, uh, in this, uh, with this exercise, you also see that uh, when we send lambda to one, the scaling symmetry of x mu disappears. Uh, so that is, a, uh, so uh, for CFT correlators, you want, uh, you want to get rid of uh, like conformal transformation. So uh, this is how it happens that uh, this conformal transformation disappears when you take L to infinity and obtain um, just the like Poincaré uh, transformations. So and then, okay, there are uh, relation between other parameters. Uh, and to see how much time I have? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so to see what uh, we mean by the flat limit in the CFT side, it is instructive to recall the expression of the uh, mass of the spin one field, which was this. And to have a finite mass in the limit uh, L to infinity, we must also send delta to infinity. So the mass in the flat uh, space is defined by this ratio delta over L. So the flat limit of the ADS three point function corresponds to sending L and delta to infinity. And to analyze the various quantities in this limit, so some technical details, so some useful tools are these asymptotic expansion of the Bessel function. So first two are just the like, uh, uh, when you send argument of Bessel function to infinity, these are the expressions. And then when you send both order of the Bessel function and the uh, uh, argument of the Bessel function to infinity, then you have this uniform expansion. Um, now to define the momenta of the field in the flat limit, we need to uplift the boundary momenta along the radial direction. So we had, uh, opti uh, we had Fourier transform the boundary direction. So we had a natural uh, candidate for them, so uh, for momenta. And uh, in the flat limit, we want the momenta along all d plus one directions. So the momenta of the massless gauge field can be uplifted to d plus one uh, dimension <coughs> in this way. So if QA is the flat uh, space momenta, then um, uh, so its momenta is given by IK comma K mu, where K is the uh, magnitude of uh, the boundary momenta. And similarly for the massive spin one field, the d-dimensional momenta can be uplifted to d plus one dimensions uh, in this way. Um, and to identify the polarizations in the flat limit, it is instructive to analyze the flat limit of the classical solutions. Um, and the structure of classical solutions in the flat limit are given by uh, these expressions. So you, we had the bulk to boundary uh, propagator. And if you take their flat limit, uh, they become, um, so their flat limit expressions are given by these expressions. So Zi's are just some constant. And then you have uh, this uh, exponential factor. And then you have polarization dependent uh, quantities. Um, and the flat limit of the gauge and Prokofiev suggests the following structure of these polarization tensors. So, so essentially, uh, one should identify in flat space these basis. One should work with these basis of polarization tensors, um, and these polarizations also satisfy the expected transversality condition for both gauge and Prokofiev. Um, and three-point function also involves the triple K integral. So we need their expression in the large delta limit. And using the asymptotic expansion of the Bessel function, we can show that the limiting form of the triple K integral takes this form. And uh, here we also generate this uh, crucial moment, uh, energy conserving delta function in this limit. So we had already Fourier transformed the uh, boundary direction. So we had the uh, conservation, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, delta function corresponding to them. But uh, we needed, we also need the delta function uh, corresponding to the energies, uh, and we get it from this flat limit of uh, triple K integrals. I have a question. Yeah. So, to get the flat space limit, what is important to consider the Wheaton diagram or like in ADS? I mean, why wouldn't have directly started from a CFT amplitude and got the flat limit? Yeah, in principle, one can do. Uh, uh, but here, I mean, we have this interpretation. So, uh, so you have some kind of more of a bulk effect. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
but I mean here you you also want more physical uh, things. Like, like for example, if you just consider uh, uh, CFT, uh, yeah, I mean uh, to get answers in flat space, uh, I mean one can just start with CFT and uh, do this analysis. Uh, in fact, I mean even if we did not know anything about like. Uh, existence of bulk, we could have done this analysis. But here the advantage was we wanted to see also the these couplings, how they are related, uh, the ADS bulk couplings. Uh, so for that, I mean, we needed uh, also this bulk. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the flat limit of we can also take the flat limit of this bulk to bulk propagator, and it precisely reduces to the Feynman propagator in flat A space in the axial gauge. Uh, so uh, with all this, one can take the flat limit of three-point function, and uh, to begin with, you get a complicated expression, but then. Um, uh, using these polarization vectors, which were dictated by the flat limit of bound to boundary propagator, one can re-express this three-point function in, uh, in uh, this way, in this form. And this is precisely the three-point function in the flat space involving a gauge field and two massive spin one fields. If you uh, if you consider in flat space the kind of um, uh, the couplings we had, uh, this uh, uh, gyromagnetic and this high derivative couplings. Uh, and uh, so in flat space, what you would have is the same structure as written in the second equation, but with some parameters, say alpha hat, beta hat, gamma hat. But now this is structure, and since they are, uh, 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 they are just ratios, they are relative terms. So to match, I mean, one can just see that uh, this analysis relates the flat space couplings alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, alpha hat, gamma hat, beta hat with the, this ADS couplings. Uh, so let me uh, conclude. Uh, so we have analyzed the flat limit of theories involving massive fields in ADS using the momentum space CFTs. And this gives tools to understand the properties of flat space QFTs directly in momentum space using the flat limit of ADS. We also show how to reproduce the flat space S matrices for the massive spinning fields. And we, all, we have also related the gyromagnetic ratio in flat space with that in ADS. Um, and some future directions are some interesting future directions to explore are the analysis of four point function and loop diagrams. Um, so, one could also try to relate this, uh, say, alpha from the uh, boundary, uh, some kind of bootstrap analysis. Uh, so, one can relate uh, this alpha with the boundary. Uh, uh, one can try to fix alpha in terms of the um, just using boundary CFT, but that requires some analysis of some bootstrap kind of analysis. Um, so that is one direction. And given that analytic properties of QFTs are most transparent in momentum space, it would be interesting to understand that from ADS CFT perspective using the tools developed here. Um, and the CFT three-point function we have computed is also useful for analyzing the presence of massive spinning fields during inflation, which is what I uh, gave one example in cosmology. So thank you. Uh, sorry? Celestial. Uh, Celestial. Ah. Celestial. So you mean you want to relate uh, the uh, this what people say this flat holography? Yeah, no, the Uh, so what I I mean uh, if we want to relate I mean this analysis with that I mean like CFT yeah 
it's it's very actually it's it's not clear if they can be related because one thing is um, here the boundary is like uh, d dimensional but their boundary is d minus 2 dimensional also the nature of infinity is different here it's like time like there it's null yeah, but you don't get to Okay. Yes, I mean, so this analysis is more like uh, more crucial. So this analysis is capturing more the like local aspect of the physics, <laughs> local physics. But if we want to do like some um, global this thing, then I think it requires something more uh, because there, I mean, we need to consider this whole global uh, structure of ADS. I think Costas had a paper on relating this um, this bondi gauge metric to the this B. Uh, Like, uh, how difficult do you think it is to compute uh, the analog of Compton scattering? Uh, which is like, which is this thing, or, or in flat space itself? I don't, uh, I don't think. This no, no, just let's say, so you, you have some general three point functions, uh -huh. right? Okay, of, uh, of massive, massive photon. Yeah. So Compton scattering is just uh, combining two such things, but with a massive propagator. Right, okay. So the question so is that. Yeah. So we need to compute the four point function. Uh, yeah, uh, two to two. Yeah. Yeah, two to two. Yeah. So in fact, yeah, this is one of the goals. Uh, our goal to compute like four point function. Um, so there, the CFT correlator is not completely fixed. So one has to do the bulk computation and okay, what one will get will get. Uh, so but, but even in flat space, I'm not sure the answer okay. is no. Yeah, it's uh, not for, 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 for any spin? Yeah, yeah, it's the number in the magnitude. For, for, you know, like a uh, Compton scatter? Compton scatter. Okay. okay. I think three level uh, should be possible, but it's not too much accurate. So, so, so. so, so yeah, just use, uh, compute the Witten diagrams from an in space, and we now have the technology to do that. Right? Um, <coughs> and then, uh, So the flat space Compton scattering is a function of all these three alpha, beta, gamma. Is that the point? Well, I'm, I'm not sure it would depend yeah. on the high space. High space uh, why would it not? Uh, I would have thought it, it would be some quadratic in alpha, beta, gamma. That it will have all the quadratic terms. So, but alpha there square will be like corrections, right? I mean, these uh, these couplings will be suppressed uh, because they are high density. <coughs> usually, we do in flat space. We do it with uh, minimal coupling. You could include them and yeah. compute the corrections to come scattering because of them, and then compare that with this correction. But to start with, I would start with the easier problem, the minimal coupling uh, on both cases. So, so that would be setting beta and gamma to zero yeah. or something? Yeah. No, I don't know. Just, just read the parts of the gamma. Yeah. Okay. In real, I mean, flat space, you have the recursion for that. For, for 4D, right? Or, or oh, any D, any D? Yeah, the max. Even minimal, you can do 4D. So in higher D, it is not good. Thank you. Any more questions? OK. Is there a none? Thank you, Prithi. So the next session starts Half an hour earlier. So, 1 30, right? No, no, sorry, 2, two, two o'clock. So, I think uh, we should get started uh, in the last session of the conference. And uh, so, the first speaker of the last session is uh, Ornob, Ornob Kundu from SINP, and he will tell us about the driven CFT and holography. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for the wonderful arrangement and, uh, and, uh, and the opportunity. Uh, to give a talk here. So what I'll try to tell you about is, uh, is I hope, uh, only uh, a part of a beginning of a story. 
Uh, in fact, I'll, tell, uh, I'll tell you uh, the part which is perhaps uh, the simplest and in some sense embarrassingly simple. Uh, but uh, my purpose will be to, to convince you that even in that simple setup, uh, what we seem to be getting, what one seems to be getting is actually quite interesting physically speaking. So, uh, what I will uh, talk about is based on uh, essentially some work that we have done recently uh, with uh, various, uh, uh, po uh, with Shruchetan who is a postdoc, Bobby and his students and Krishnendu who is a well known condensed matter theorist. So, my talk partly will have a condensed matter kind of motivation, but what I will try to, try to also emphasize is that perhaps these ideas, uh, these observations and these physics are also relevant for, uh, for a more broader point of view. In particular in quantum gravity, although I will have not, uh, I will not have very precise things to say about quantum gravity per se. Um, and uh, it goes without saying that if you have any questions, comments or concerns at any point of time, uh, I would most welcome that. Uh, so, please uh, feel free to stop me if you have any anything to, to say. All right. So, I will try to stick to a, a rough outline like this. Uh, if you cannot see the pointer for some reason, but anyway. So, so the rough outline would be, I will uh, I'll start with some motivation and introductory remarks which will have substantial overlap with, uh, with the motivations and, uh, and, and uh, uh, for other, other, other talks by other speakers in the, in the conference. And in particular, what I will try to uh, emphasize, on, emphasize on is that dynamics uh, for, for, especially for quantum systems is a very important question or important issue to understand better. And in particular, I will focus on a very special kind of dynamics here, which is non-equilibrium. And by that, what I mean is that, uh, it, it, so, so I will have a dynamics governed by a Hamiltonian, which is explicitly time dependent. So, it is a complicated problem, because we all know that uh, uh, time dependent Hamiltonians are not easy to handle. But nonetheless, I will try to convince you that there is one particular framework where uh, this kind of questions or at least a subset of questions which you might be interested in can be, uh, can be handled pretty uh, nicely and in particular within the context of conformal field theories, which is where also uh, interest from uh, more high energy and uh, uh, quantum gravity kind of perspective uh, uh, becomes relevant. In particular, I will tell you about a CFT description, which is obviously an exactly solvable description, barring some, some simple numerical things. Uh, but it is exactly solvable and what you see and what you learn from physics from very low point functions which are of course expected to be universal, uh, uh, universal features and as well as higher point functions and out of time ordered correlators and so on and so forth. So, they will have very precise statements and in the last part, I will try to tell you about a holographic description of similar things which has some naturally intriguing components to it and which seem also generalizable to other and relatable to other contexts that we have seen so far. So, that hopefully will become clear what I mean by the sentences. And then of course, I will try to conclude with some outlook and, uh, and, and open directions etcetera. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, a very broad motivation is that dynamical aspects are very important. If we, if we want to understand nature, that is what we have to understand. Everything is dynamical around us. And in particular, you know, there are experiments like collider experiments as well as tabletop experiments where these, these aspects become very important in if you want to understand the experiments themselves. Of course, also the universe at large, for example, cosmological scenarios and so on and so forth. Great. So, there is no, no doubt about that, but it is a challenging aspect because many of the methods that we use in conventional uh, uh, in, in physics are, are rather limited or appear rather limited in addressing these questions in general at broad. So, it would be good to have at least some models where we can ask uh, even a subset of such questions. So, this will be the purpose of this talk for example and that is relevant of course, for strongly coupled quantum field theories. So, things to do with uh, let us say collider physics where QCD becomes relevant as well as quantum dynamics of black holes uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So, what happens usually in these dynamical situations is that you see the emergence of various time scales, for example, scrambling time scale, Heisenberg time scale and Poincare recurrence. What I have to say today have nothing to do with Heisenberg or Poincare. Uh, it will have something to do with scrambling time scale, but you will see that this is also not the focus of my talk really. So, I'll, I want to say something much simpler than this in fact. <clears throat> so, 
in particular, if you, if, you, if you frame a question in this point of view, then the question is really too broad. Where should we really start? Because dynamics could be you know, just, just about anything. So one place where people have figured out that interesting things happen in a controllable way is when you take a system, when you take a quantum system and drive it by some Hamiltonian, by some force. So let's, let's think, of a, think of a tabletop experiment in this room where you have a quantum mechanical setup set up on this table and you have something which is driving the system. It's as simple as that. Why is this important? Well, what, has, what people have realized is that this is in some sense a very condensed matter point of view or, or motivation is that if you drive a system, quantum system in this way, in particular if you have a periodic driving, then you see phases of, of the system which you do not see in equilibrium. So there are new phases that appear. For example, uh, the so-called time crystals, uh, dynamical phase transitions, tunable ergodicity, just to name a few. These are names I will not be using too much. But just to tell you that there are various physical, physically distinct phenomena that happen with periodic driving uh, a, a quantum mechanical system which we have not seen or which has no analog in equilibrium, uh, 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 equilibrium physics. And, and then uh, uh, of course the question is fine we can do this but usually what happens is that if you have a complicated spin system and so on and so forth these are difficult things to actually calculate even there. So it would be good to have some exactly solvable models, which is why I will focus on CFT in 2D, where this will also be present in some form. Okay, good. So as I said, the motivation is understanding, in some sense the motivation is that understanding of phases in physics that you do not see otherwise in equilibrium scenario, but uh, turns up uh, when you have non-equilibrium driven uh, scenario, and in particular if you have a periodic driving. And one mathematical curiosity that you might associate with this is the following. Suppose you have you know, some driving which, is basically, which can be basically seen as a map. So you take a coordinate z and it, it sends it to f of z. Now we all know that there are very interesting maps like this when if you apply this transformation n number of times, you get some, uh, I mean you, you, you're supposed to get some complicated, uh, you're supposed to send this point at z to some, some other place. So it can run all the way to infinity, it can go to some very strange place, or it can come back to itself. So one particular example, one very popular example of such maps, when it becomes uh, inter interesting is the Mandelbrot set, for example. So this is just a comment. I will not be having, uh, I, I will not have anything to say about the Mandelbrot set or other, other things related to it in this, in, the, in, this, in this talk. But just to make a point that, you know, the, the, so the periodic driving that, that I'm talking about has a natural place in mathematics also uh, in terms of maps and so on, which, where it can show some interesting and new, new features, new mathematical features. And it's possibly uh, an interesting question to wonder about whether there are uh, precise connections where you can make uh, statements or you can connect observations that you see here to observations uh, of non-equilibrium dynamics. Good, so let me start with a 2D CFT Hamiltonian, which we all know is a completely standard thing. So the 2D, Hamil 2D CFT Hamiltonian, as we all know, suppose the CFT is on, uh, living on a cylinder, is defined this way. So this is the Hamiltonian, where I have integrated over the zero, zero component of the stress tensor with an envelope function, if you wish, with, with an non-trivial function f of x and t. Usually this f of x and, x and t is taken to be one. That's what we are most familiar with, but you can take it to be a function. And in particular, if you want periodicity, then you impose some periodic, periodicity condition on the function itself, so that the function comes back to itself when you take t to t plus capital T, capital T being the period of the, of the drive. That's what I'm going to focus on. So what this boils down to is basically having a Hamiltonian which becomes explicitly time dependent. So it'll become clearer what I mean by this. So for example, in 2D CFT, what you can do is you can take this function and Fourier decompose, of course. So if you take this Hamiltonian and do the Fourier decomposition, you can rewrite this Hamiltonian in terms of the standard Virasoro generators. So an example of that is the following. Suppose you want a Hamiltonian, which is, uh, uh, which is time dependent, but in a, in a somewhat simple way, and in the following uh, sense, that H of T becomes H0, meaning that the standard CFT Hamiltonian we are familiar with for a particular time T1, and then it switches to some other Hamiltonian which I denote by H phi for, and it stays that way for a particular time T2. So you can hear me? Oh, okay. 
sorry. Is that better? Okay. Good. Uh, so, so then, uh, yeah. So uh, that's right. So then, uh, then the sum of t1 and t2 is basically the period of the drive, right? So it's basically the same thing, repeating again and again. And if you just check with this, you can see that uh, you know h0 is uh, something that you can write in purely in terms of l0 and l0 bar, where l0, l0, l0 bar are familiar uh, parts of the Virasoro generator. Whereas h phi, which is what I have written here, can be written in terms of l plus and l minus, and and their uh, anti anti holomorphic pieces, which I I have not written here. So the point is that the whole Hamiltonian, the total Hamiltonian, can be written in terms of l0, l plus, and l minus. So it only involves the SL2R generators. That's the that's the simplest part part of it. But you could of course rewrite, you, you know, you could you could of course write a Hamiltonian which is basically a combination of all the Virasoro generators. That would be much more complicated, but much more general. This is a very special case. Yes? No, no. So you are repeating it. So you have H0 for T1, up to T1. Then after that, you become H5 for up to T2. Then again, it becomes H0, and it, and it goes that way. So you take one cycle, which has period t, and then you keep repeating it. So it says, uh, what is it called? Square pulse. Okay, and here, as you can see, this phi is uh, for me is an external parameter, which will show up in the in the uh, in the discussion uh, in the subsequent discussions. But this is really a tunable parameter that I have my uh, uh, at my disposal. I could I could tune it to be anything that I want. Sorry? Yes? Yeah, yeah, I said that I'm ignoring the anti holomorphic pieces. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. Of course. Every, anywhere you don't see the L bars appearing, it's understood. Yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, that's not very crucial. What I really want to say is that this is one example where I can write H phi purely in terms of L0, L plus, and L minus. Anything that I can write as L0, L plus, and L minus, I can choose. This is particularly uh, popular in the literature for various reasons. But yes, you can, you can pick anything that you want. It is, it is because of the specific choice of this cosine, sorry, this cosine function. This is the important piece. So see, you are doing a mode expansion, right? So what function you choose will have a particular mode expansion. So depending on the mode, uh, sorry, depending on the choice of the function, you will get whatever modes you have. Yes, yes. So I'm giving you, giving you just an example where I can write down the full Hamiltonian as some linear combination of L0, L plus, and L minus. And it will become momentarily clear why this is simple. You can already see why this is simple. This is SL2R, the simplest thing you could probably do. But in general, you can write down a Hamiltonian, which is instead of just simple L0, it's a linear combination of all the LMs and their LM bars. For that, the function could be something more complicated. But that's also, of course, a little more difficult to analyze practically. Yes, on a cylinder, yeah. Which is. Sorry, I should have mentioned this L is that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Good. Good. So, what is the evolution operator? This we all know. Of course, in quantum mechanics, we write down the evolution operator as exponential of the Hamiltonian itself, which is what I have written there. Nothing, 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 uh, nothing new. The only thing I have, I have done there is I have in, inserted a, 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 a small n which is basically telling me how many periods I have driven the system with. So that n, for me, for now on, is going to keep track of the time. So that is what I will call time. And in a moment, it will become clear why, that, why I'm calling that time. is because if you, what you can do is you can take that evolution operator and rewrite that evolution operator as this, as a single exponential. See, the, in, the, the first line has, a, has, a, has an integral in the exponential, but in the second line, I have written, I have rewritten that as a some effective Hamiltonian, which in the literature, literature is called a Floquet Hamiltonian, and that Hamiltonian has no integral of nothing, 
that is just a Hamiltonian that depends on the period of the drive and uh, this i n factor comes out in front. Uh, this n is called, this has a name, uh, uh, it is called uh, stroboscopic time and therefore stroboscopic dynamics, the name is not important. The point is that this we can do and sometimes we can find exact uh, expressions for this Floquet Hamiltonian, sometimes we can find approximate expressions of this Floquet Hamiltonian. But the point is this can be done and this will be the main, one of the main uh, tricks that, that I will be using. Yes, 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 that is right. Good. And now comes the, uh, again the simple observation that if I have a Hamiltonian, if I have my Floquet Hamiltonian, let us say, which is obvious from here, if I can rewrite my Floquet Hamiltonian in terms of L0, L plus and L minus, then this evolution operator is SU11 valued, right? That is because the, by definition that is true. And so, if I want to ask a question that how an operator in this system evolves in time, in particular evolves with n, all I have to do is take an operator and look at its Heisenberg evolution and that Heisenberg evolution is going to be nothing but coordinate transformation as far as the, uh, as far as the Floquet Hamiltonian action is, uh, 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 the, the, the evolution operator action is concerned. So, we know how to do that for primary operators and that is the definition of how primary operators transform. And because I chose a, a very simple case of SL2R, uh, a Hamiltonian made out of SL2R generators, my transformation is going to be the Mobius transformation. It's very very simple. Yes, uh, I, I I will have something written. Yes, it's actually not going to be something more than I already what I already said. It's just a linear combination of L0, L plus, and L minus with some coefficients in front. But yeah, that's the most. I mean, in the in this context, that's the most general. Good. Sorry. You can define this. You see, I mean, you can certainly say that th this is not a definition. This is, uh, I mean, there is nothing I have done here. This is just quantum mechanics. You can write this as equal to this and then say that I want to solve for HF. Now, that solution may, may not be, may not come very easy, right? That is something you have to find. Uh, and in some cases, you can find it exactly. In some cases, you can find it approximately. And there is a whole literature how you find it in, uh, in various, various approximations and so on and so forth. Can be done. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. You you can you can yeah yeah. That is correct. That is yeah exactly. So HF will contain that information precisely precisely, which was yeah. So what I showed you in a moment, I'll show you another another Hamiltonian. In fact, maybe in this slide. Yes, good. So this is for example. You could, you know, you could write down a Hamiltonian like this, where f, f, f of t and f1 of t could be any function that you want. It, nobody can stop you from, uh, from choosing them. But you choose them in, of course, in some convenient way that you can do the analysis. And in the literature, well, let me put it this way. This slide has various technical details, but the only important thing or relevant thing that I want, 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 want to emphasize on is the following, that uh, you can indeed, uh, uh, indeed do something like what you were saying, which is a continuous drive in the sense that you do not do a square pulse kind of thing, but it is like, it's like a sinusoidal if you wish or something more complicated if you wish. You can do that and what happens is that in this case, you can also determine your Floquet Hamiltonian and correspondingly your evolution operator. And your evolution operator, uh, uh, remember, is just a, just a coordinate transformation, it is just a Mobius transformation. So all it needs you to, do, you, you to evaluate is how the, how the Mobius transformation looks like. And in this case, the Mobius transformation, which by definition should look like this, will, uh, uh, what, what it will be is that you can determine this AI, BI, CI, DI in terms of all the parameters that you have given in the drive protocol, so to speak. I is basically the ith operation, so ith cycle, which is for me the time. So, uh, and as you can see that, sorry, what? Yes, yes, sure. I mean, uh, oh, well, I mean, in, in there, the, the central chart term does not appear, right? In the SL2R. Yes. Yeah. 
Exactly, that is why this SL2 R is chosen. Otherwise, yeah, you, you will generate more and more stuff. You can, you can. Yeah, absolutely, you are right. You are right, and that that people also have done. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, in some sense, that is actually a little more clever because you see that with all the questions, I mean, any question that I ask here, which depends on the Schwarzian, I'll have zero. But in your case, I'll get a non-zero answer, and that's what you can get. You can get lots of physics here. But yeah, it's really that simple state. Yes, 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 exactly, yes, yeah. Repeated, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, no, no, so, sorry, sorry. This is a bit uh, misleading. Okay, so what I, what I'm doing here, you see, this is just a transformation of a primary operator, right, on the plane. So these are the coordinates that I have on the plane. You see an index here also, which tells me how many times this periodic drive has appeared. Ah, yes, yes, yeah, you're, yes, thank you. This, uh, this should have an index, yeah, thank you. I, 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 I guess there will be more like this, so. <laughs> like Chetan, I'm also seeing this for the first time. You know? <laughs> so, 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 you know. Which is why I also don't know how I am pacing myself, but okay, I think I'm going a bit slowly. <laughs> okay, good. Good, yes. So this is, uh, this is really some very simple stuff. It's like how many times you apply conformal transformation. That's your time. And uh, uh, yeah, that's really it. Nothing more to it. Good. So we have various parameters, et cetera. Let's not worry about this. All that I want you to sort of, uh, I mean, take away from this is that there is a combination, complicated combination of all these parameters, which I call alpha. And that alpha is the relevant parameter, which we will become the relevant parameter. And as you tune alpha, you will see various things happening. Okay? So theta is related to phi. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, probably. Oh, sorry, Bessel functions, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's an infinite sum of all the Bessels, uh, yeah. It's a complicated thing that, so this is a result that comes out from determining the Floquet Hamiltonian. But it's not important for us. I mean, it's, you can just take it to be some, some parameter. Great, good. So the, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is the following. Let me give you the bottom line. The bottom line is you can see what is called a heating and a non-heating phase with a non-trivial phase boundary if you tune this parameter alpha. So why, how do I know this, these are heating and non-heating phases or how do I define this because these are not equilibrium uh, uh, standard phase transition load. So the point is that you compute correlators. So let's say you compute, for example, uh, unequal time two point function, vacuum correlator under this drive. What you'll see is that the vacuum correlator will have a telltale signature of exponential decay that you see in a thermal state. Okay? In, in a particular range of alpha. In another range of alpha, you will see that it will be oscillating forever. And at the phase boundary, what I call phase boundary, is where you will see that this uh, correlator will have a power law behavior in time. So if you wish, this is my definition of heating, non-heating, and phase boundary. Heating phase, non-heating phase, and phase boundary. And to add more to it, it's not just simply two-point function you can compute many other things. Like for example, you can compute the stress tensor expectation value and you will see that the stress tensor expectation value will be growing exponentially in the heating phase, will be oscillating in the non-heating phase and will be power law in the phase boundary. So the point is that this identification of these phases are quite consistent across various observables or in this case correlators that we can compute in CFT. And these are simple calculations because this is really simple because this just involves two point and three point functions in, in CFT, which we all know they're fixed. We don't have to even compute anything. You can compute entanglement entropy also, which is a little bit more complicated, but nonetheless, it's a four point function essentially. And it also has similar feature. For example, in the heating phase, it has linearly uh, growing uh, behavior with N. N, remember N is the time here. It's oscillating in the non-heating phase and it has a log growth at the phase boundary. So in that way, yes. So what is the initial state? 
So yes, good. So for example, here, if I chose initial state to be vacuum, that would not work because I'm doing an SL2R drive. SL2R will, des will kill the vacuum. So this will not give me any non-trivial time dependence. So here I need to compute the stress tensor uh, expectation value on a, on a strip, for example, instead of the cylinder. Another way of saying it, uh, you can choose an in-state and out-state. You can compute the stress tensor expectation value in the heavy state, heavy primary state. That you can also do. So but, uh, this exponent drive is only controlled by this EV dagger of the Correct. That's right. That doesn't depend on the state in the sense that as long as you choose a state which is interesting enough. So vacuum will of course not show you anything, but that's because of the choice we made. But here, uh, yeah, here for example, a similar thing, uh, I think here also, because you cannot take your, uh, you cannot compute your entanglement entropy in vacuum, because then also you have a two point fun equal time two point function, which will not show you anything. So, yes. Yes, you, you, you mean what will happen to its one point function or? Yeah, so, so again, if you compute its vacuum one point function, then nothing, right? Because vacuum one point function of a primary operator will be zero and. Oh, the operator itself, yeah, the operator itself is just given by some conformal transformation being repeatedly uh, applied to it. That's all. So that, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, as always in CFT, right? Yeah. So when it depends on central charge, no one has really done it. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, that's a more complicated thing. So uh, usually, um, well, no, uh, no, sorry, I take it back. That's not correct. No, no, L, uh, sorry. If you take any SL2, which does not involve L plus L minus, L one and L minus one, but the other, other higher ones, then it will involve the central charge. So what that gives you is some constant. It doesn't affect the time dependence, I think. So the, yeah, sorry, I, these features will remain. So these features are very robust and they're robust for very simple reasons really, because we are doing some very simple things in, in the CFT. The point is that they, they exist. Yes. Correct. 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 Yes. Yes. Good. In terms of, you want to see it in terms of the map, a property of the map. Uh, geometrically, I would not be. Correct. Yes. So, so. Uh, I don't think it's that simple. But I mean, yes, they, they, there are some properties of the orbit that you can associate it with, but I can give you a much simpler answer. It's not that geometric, but it's an answer in terms of the Mobius transformation itself. So that is coming. Uh, yes, uh, fixed point is, is one particular feature, but uh, that's not all. There is more to the Mobius transformation. So in fact, there are, you can classify Mobius SL2R transformations in three different kinds. So which is uh, what I'm getting at, great. You asked it at the right moment. Sorry? Yes. In time dependent piece. Um, let me not uh, let let me not say one way or the other because I don't quite remember uh, exactly how the central charge will affect. But in the st in the stress tensor, I'm fairly sure uh, what I said is right. In entanglement entropy, maybe uh, maybe there is something. But 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 all I wanted to say there is that these three very simple things are completely comes to you without almost trying anything. So now let me try to un uh, uh, answer your question in a way which is I I think it's less satisfactory than you probably what you might want, but nonetheless. So as I said that there are various, you know, the question is how do you characterize this transition? Suppose I accept that this is a phase transition and so on and so forth. So how do I characterize? So let's look at the parameters of the problem and here they are. Well, I said that this alpha is basically what you have to keep a tab on and let's just keep track of this. So the Mobius transformations can be classified in three different ways. If you just compute the trace of the matrix and take a mod of it. So for example, if the trace is bigger than two, it's called hyperbolic, it's less than two, it's called elliptic, and it's, if it's equal to two, it's called parabolic. And in this, con I mean, in the language of this parameter, the relevant parameter, this translates to 
alpha square bigger than 1, alpha square less than 1, or alpha square equal to 1. And in fact, these are precisely the heating, non-heating, and the phase boundary structures. So in that sense, it's exactly connected to a property of the SL2R transformation. And it can be, can be done more generally when you have not just uh, L0, L plus, L minus, L1, L minus 1, but higher Ls. Then also similar structure holds. So in terms of orbit, I'm not so sure, but I think there are some statements to that effect as well. I think so, yes, I think so. But I don't have a picture in my mind right away, but yeah. You mean in these ones? It, yeah, yeah, so, so, so these effects, so SL2R is the global part of the conformal transformation, right? So these three are contain three different kinds of transformations. Right now, I don't remember which is which, but one is dilatation, the other one is special conformal, the other one is uh, uh, rotation, and so on. So that's what, the, that's what this is. So it's related to what you were saying. So the volume might increase or decrease uh, on dilatation, and one of them is that. Yes, exactly. Good. So in terms of the Floquet Hamiltonian, for example, this is uh, an answer to your question. So this is, if you wish, the most general Floquet Hamiltonian that you can have, where alpha, beta, gamma are just, please don't confuse this alpha with that alpha. I'm sorry, but uh, I'm going to have this <laughs> non-triviality, I think, more than once, but uh, hopefully it will not be confusing. Uh, this is really the most general thing for some real alpha, beta, and gamma. And why do I write this down? As I said, you know, this Locke Hamiltonian is very useful because that's what really determines the phases. And in particular, you can look at the Casimir of this algebra, which is given by this combination of the constants. And this heating, non-heating, and, and the phase transitions can be classified as, as this particular combination to be either below zero, bigger than zero, or equal to zero. So these are essentially equivalent ways of saying the same thing. Uh, it's just that I have uh, rewritten, uh, essentially, the, the relevant parameter that, that by tuning which you can get an access to various phases. Okay, good. So why is this interesting? Well, first of all, it, uh, uh, so for various reasons, the, 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 the idea of dynamical phase transition in the sense that when you have a system and drive it uh, in some way, uh, the system can go through various phases. That's an interesting and open question on, uh, about which uh, not much is understood. So this particular feature or this particular setup gives you a very uh, controlled uh, model for, for, for understanding a dynamical phase transition, for example. And you can compute a number of observables because it's just CFT correlator calculation, which people have done. And I will just tell you about one particular, one additional correlator that we can compute here, which is out of time ordered correlators, which is anyways hard to compute, uh, uh, let alone in a dynamical situation. It's really very hard, yes. 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 So that property you decide in terms of time. Correct. So then you can have different heating etc. So all I you can consider the all I. Yes. Yes. There is there is one concept of orbit, right? So because it's not a discrete orbit that is changing. It will always either in a hyperbolic state in terms of n and t. Well, I mean, I, okay, you. No, that is true, that is true. But uh, what might happen is that, uh, you, you know, af after a few times, let's say i equal to two or three, relatively small uh, value of i, yeah. which is one or two drives, you essentially get to this. So you could start with hyperbolic and... Uh, no, 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 that will not happen. No, 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 that will, yeah. Correct, that will not happen. That will not happen, yes. Yes, 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 yes. So it will keep you in that uh, uh, in that sector, if you wish. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly, exactly. So, right. See, on, only way you can go from here to here is by tuning this alpha, which is at with with you. That is what you can you can change. Okay, good. So. All right, good. So let me just very uh, uh, let me sketch out a particular calculation, which uh, which also other speakers have uh, spoken about, uh, that has become 
kind of an interesting observable that uh, are fairly, I mean, widely explored observable these days. So, out of time ordered correlators. And one question you can ask is, uh, well, I mean, you know, what I have told you so far, if it is a CFT and if my statements and classifications are based on uh, one point, two point functions or three point functions of CFT, then how does it know about the dynamics really? Because they are just universal. So, you will always get that answer no matter whether I am looking at Ising CFT or a large C CFT. That cannot possibly be true, but because their dynamics is not the same. So, one, one way of distinguishing between them is to of course, compute higher point functions and you can compute entanglement entropy in a non-trivial state. That is one way to do it. The other way to do it, another, uh, another class of interesting observables are the out of time ordered correlators, which you can also compute in this case analytically. All right. So, I think I do not need to, uh, especially after Felix's talk, I think uh, this is more or less, uh, I am not saying anything new here, it is just, uh, 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 just a very brief introduction of this, uh, this kind of correlators is, uh, well, we all understand classically what, uh, what, uh, uh, what chaos uh, or Lyapunov exp exponent means in terms of trajectories and so on and so forth. And when you go to quantum mechanics, what you do is you compute expectation values of commutators raised to some power. In fact, you can compute the simplest thing you can compute is uh, expectation value of a squared commutator. And that object will contain two kinds of correlation functions. One is time ordered, the other one is out of time ordered. Uh, that is visually clear because uh, this one is out of time ordered because you, ha you see that uh, the, the time ordering from uh, left to right is appearing as 0 t 0 t instead of 0, 0, t, t or t, t, 0, 0. So, that is uh, that's the notion. And why is this important? It is important for various reasons. One of them is, for example, uh, for a quantum mechanical system, uh, these out of time ordered correlators uh, can define an effective light cone, a light cone of uh, information propagation and so on. So, so, so that is an important observable, uh, which uh, we can compute in this case also. So, Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, good. So, so how do you do that cal calculation? Well, all our calculations are going to be Euclidean calculations, which we can do on uh, for CFT uh, easily, or at least we know how to do it in a controlled way. And then we take analytic continuations. And the non-triviality of this out of time ordered correlators come uh, from uh, essentially how you take the analytic continuation. In particular. Uh, what we can compute here are basically a four point function and let us say I am computing it in a large CCFT. So, if it is a heavy, heavy light, light correlator, you do the usual standard approximation of identity block dominance because you know the, how the block looks like and then you just substitute it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the answer and then you take a, take a appropriate analytic continuation. So, non-triviality, it is very well known where it comes from. The non-triviality of this dynamics comes from the fact that these blocks have in the complex plane have branch cuts running from 1 to infinity. And if you do an analytic continuation where uh, the cross ratio, so, so of course, the block depends on, 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 on the single cross ratio and, and its conjugate, but let us just focus on the cross ratio for the time being. So, so, if the cross ratio crosses this branch cut, then you get a non-trivial phase in this function, which translates into an exponential growth in real time. That is what happens in CFT. But in that same analytic continuation, if that, if, if you know, your cross ratio goes around and comes back to 0 without crossing the branch cut, you do not see anything non-trivial. So, to summarize, the statement is that if this situation happens as you explore how the cross ratio behaves uh, in the complex plane, uh, um, as you go from small values of the cross ratio to large values of it, uh, if this happens, then you get a non-trivial uh, exponential growth, in other words, a chaotic feature, and if this happens, you do not. And normally in CFT, if you take for example, uh, uh, if you take for example, large CCFT, what will happen is that this scenario will happen when you are computing actually time ordered correlators and this will happen when you are computing out of time ordered correlators. So, for us, for the driven CFT, something happens, something interesting happens is that of course, you can see, you can compute this correlator on the plane, it is an Euclidean correlation function. It also depends on the cross ratio, but now the cross ratio is a bit uh, uh, is a bit structured, so to speak, because it has some uh, some uh, spatial profile, if you wish. Why did that happen? That happened because you see we, we are we are driving a Lorentz invariant system with a time profile. So that means it's not homogeneous in time. And if you do that driving, 
because of because under uh, I mean because the system is un underlying system is Lorentz invariant, it will mix up time and space, and it can create spatial inhomogeneity. That's what happens in the in the cross ratio, and uh, what I want to really say here is that there is a range. Remember that this parameter alpha was appearing as a, as a parameter which tuned the phase transitions and various phases. In given this alpha, there's a range for x in which, under which, or within which, you see uh, a non-trivial OTOC behavior. But if you if you go in outside of this range, you don't see anything non-trivial. So that's an additional structure. I don't know if there is a very simpler, uh, there's a simpler way of understanding it. It's just an observation. Uh, it's a result of the calculation. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's essentially because of uh, this inhomogeneity that is present in the system. And in particular, in pictures, somebody mentioned uh, fixed points. So you know, these transformations also has fixed points, which you can analyze by solving this equation. And so the point is that, so suppose these two are the two fixed points. So when you have this operator arrangement such that both the spatial locations are on one side of these two fixed points, then we'll see a non-trivial feature. If they are on two sides, we will not. That's just a geometric uh, statement. It's a result of the calculation, essentially. Okay, good. So, yes. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it will be damped, essentially. Thank you. So, so there are three qualitatively distinct behavior, which goes with this uh, heating, non-heating, and phase boundary intuition. And in particular, in the heating phase, sorry, let me just, uh, uh, just trivial comment. In the heating phase, it's exponentially growing in time, time being the n. In non-heating, it's oscillatory, and in the, on the phase boundary, it's just uh, some power law. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, and as I said, that there is also some spatial structure, and the spatial structure also emerges in the emergent light cone. So the light cone is no longer uh, uniform across all, or across all uh, or spatial direction. It also has some spatial structure, which you can analyze, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, uh, that, yes. Then you don't see this. No, then the, then the correlator doesn't, uh, then the correlator actually decays. Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yeah, it, 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 yeah, it has a similar feature, that's right, because, you know, at, at the end of the day, that's also a four-point function, if you are computing it in a non-trivial state, it will have similar things, uh, I mean, similar meaning that the fixed points will play a role, so let me put it this way, that the fixed points, which I did not emphasize on, but just mentioned casually, also at the beginning, uh, these fixed points seem to play a role in this dynamics, they determine where you can see some interesting structure, et cetera, et cetera. That, so the answer is yes. The, perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. No, th 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 that is fine. The only reason I'm a bit hesitant in saying that uh, saying that it explains is because that, you know whenever you have this entanglement kind of picture where you have this uh, quasi particles uh, uh, being emitted and absorbed and so on, always those particles are emitted at speed of light. So entanglement, for example, does not coincide with the light cone that this uh, out of time ordered correlators give. So out of time ordered correlators not only give you an exponential growth in time, they also define you a light cone. And that light cone may not be uh, agreeing with your entanglement picture. So the butterfly velocity will grossly violate uh, this uh, nice picture. But yeah, there might be some qualitative similarity. Yeah, I mean, there is some qualitative similarity, might be more to it, yes. Good, uh, right. So this point is that, of course, this is a large C result. You can do the same calculation in Ising model. It's again, dead simple, you will see no such things appearing in the, in, the four, in the out of time ordered correlator. The out of time ordered correlator will be completely constant. Sorry? Where? 
yeah, in the in the block. So, for example, uh, uh, this one. So, when I compute the uh, four point function, I use the identity block. No, no, no. This is the heavy, heavy light light. Is the standard? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the identity. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that that is important. So this is this feature is not uh, true for any CFT. In particular for Ising, you can see that this will be a constant function, completely featureless. So in fact, in some sense, you can say, oh, well, that doesn't go with hitting, non-hitting uh, 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 premises at all. But you could also say that it actually does know what the dynamics is. So what my two low point function, like two point function was telling me that this should be identified with the heating phase. Now you can compute an OTOC and, uh, and say that, okay, this is a heating phase, but for this class of CFTs, not otherwise. All right, great. So one more thing that this is an, as far as I know, this is the only example of, so to speak, chaos in vacuum state, because this is not a thermal state calculation. By definition, it's a vacuum state calculation, only time dependent. And there is no known, at least not that I know of, any equilibrium analog. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I am, I am. After that, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course, I'm normalizing it, yes. Sorry, yeah. Good, so now you can ask what is the holographic perspective? So let me just very quickly tell you what you can do. Remember that we, 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 can, we can write down our Floquet Hamiltonian in the simple form, and now we all know how does this L zeros and uh, L plus and uh, L one and L minus ones lift to an ADS three geometry as as bulk transformations, if you wish? And we know explicit forms, explicit coordinate in a in a given coordinate system, like the one I have chosen here, which is a Poincaré coordinate system for ADS three. I know how to write down exactly this these generators. So let me write that down. So given this Floquet Hamiltonian, I can route, write down. Sorry. Yes. Now I am uh, in a geometry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so. So, so, so. Uh, uh, what I'll be doing uh, is slightly. Yes. The answer is yes, but. So, so let me tell you what, what, what I'm going to do with this. So, good. So, given this bulk Hamiltonian, let me now solve an equation. The equation that I want to solve is the following. Let's suppose I say that the bulk Hamiltonian generates a curve. Like, for example, if I have del t, that will generate uh, the time translation. I have something more complicated, so I have some, some complicated object, right? It's a patch of the geometry that I started with. And what I do technically is I solve this equation where my bulk Hamiltonian is given by A alpha del alpha, and I solve an equation of this form, which is del x alpha del xi is A alpha, where xi is the, if you wish, the inherent intrinsic coordinate uh, on, 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 on the curve that the bulk Hamiltonian generates, and x alpha is just the geometry that I started with. If you solve this equation and then compute the induced metric on the, on, on, on the curve, you get these two metrics for these two different phases. So definition of the curve is a solution of this equation. So remember, yes, so the H boundary is this, which is purely a boundary object. Yes, yeah, 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 that's right, right? So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad name, perhaps, but sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> it is, look at the mathematical expression, not the name. I have named it badly, perhaps. Yes, yes, then you solve for the bulk, and you determine the metric on the bulk. What you see is the following. You see a non-heating, I mean, corresponding to the non-heating phase, you get some expression. Corresponding to the heating phase, you get some expression. But if you look at the expression, something is clear. If you look at, forget about all this, sorry about that. If you look at this expression, you see that for constant phi, this is an ADS2. And in fact, this is a global ADS2. Similarly, if I, took a, if I take a constant phi slice here, what I get here is an ADS2 black hole. 
or the so-called Schwarzschild patch of the ADS2, which I'll also show in a picture in a moment. No, I'm solving this equation, right? Yes. In this, th th that is right. So, but, but here, you, you see, because the Hamiltonian is just SL2R, right? I, I already have the answer. No, no that, that, that's, so, so that's not the calculation I'm doing. All I'm, all I'm saying is that let me compute this. And uh, if I compute this, then I see that I have, I have sort of two patches, if you wish. And in particular, the constant phi slices are, one of them is, an, is a global ADS2 patch. The other one is a, uh, is a Schwarzschild ADS2 patch. And what I want to say next is that just on these two patches, I can distinguish between the phases. I, so that's why what yeah. you're doing is yeah. testing exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a different calculation. Yes. That, that we are not doing. Yes. So what you're saying is the because it wasn't Yeah, yeah, because it, it's a patch. It's not a, it's not a submanifold. Mm -hmm. It's a patch of ADS3. So what the solutions of this will give you a patch of ADS3. Now this is one patch, this is one patch. Somehow I got it. All I'm now saying is that if you look at the phi constant patches, this looks like a global ADS2, this looks like a Schwarzschild ADS2. That's all there is to it. Uh, in fact, what I will have in, uh, in maybe in five minutes, uh, that observation is enough. In fact, you need nothing more. I mean, of course, you can do some calculations, which I'll describe very quickly. But that's really all. So geometrically, it's the following thing. So if you look at in terms of the patches, in, in terms of phi constant slices, so this is, if you wish, the global patch. It's a full rectangle. This is the Poincaré patch, which is, uh, which is uh, a triangular part of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the full rectangle. And this is the Schwarzschild uh, heating patch, which has a horizon. Okay. And in fact, you can, you can explicitly write down, for example, coordinate transformations that relate coordinates from here to here and, and, and so on and so forth. That you can also do. It's all uh, can be done. Good. So now you can do a very simple calculation. You can say that in these patches, now I'm going to do is I'm going to consider, let's say, a probe object. Let's say a probe brain, for example. So you can classify, sorry, you can, you, you can, you can do a gauge fixing on the, on, the, on the brain itself and you can compute uh, or you can calculate how the profiles or how the solutions of the pro probe brain look like. And in the probe limit, there's a very simple solution where phi is constant, in particular a constant angle, etc. And what you can do is you can take either the heating patch or the non-heating patch, insert a probe and compute their on-shell action, which is basically like a free energy calculation. If you do that, you will find that the heating minus non-heating is something non-zero, and in fact, it's negative. So you'll say that if I tune my phase, sorry, this mu is again, there are many parameters. This mu is basically, uh, ah, yeah, this object, the square root of d. And the sine of d mattered. So if you tune you know, this, this d parameter, by tuning which you get the phase transition from heating to non-heating, non what you see is that this free energy is lowered. So the statement is the following, that by inserting these probe brains, you can detect this phase transition as a, a somewhat of a familiar first order phase transition that we see in, in a Hawking, -like, Hawking page-like scenario. It also has discontinuous jumps, et cetera, et cetera, characteristics of first order phase transition. Now you can do a little bit more, since you are into it already, if you are. You can do uh, what is called a end of the world brain calculation where in fact these uh, phi slices become even more naturally uh, apparent in the sense that what you do now is you don't insert the brains in a probe limit, but you say that the, probe, uh, that the brains are also back reacting. So therefore you solve a 3D gravity system with 2D uh, hypersurfaces inserted. So there's some uh, uh, junction condition that you have to satisfy. And the junction conditions uh, what end up determining, uh, they determine how the brains look like and in particular, these green dashed lines are the ones that show up as solutions of these equations. 
which is sometimes known as Karsh Randall brains. And uh, these are essentially the phi constant slices as well. Good, you can go crazy even, or we did go crazy. Uh, you not don't necessarily have to. You can insert more than one brains if you wish. There are more, there are uh, additional motivations from CFT point of view uh, that I can probably tell you uh, if you are interested why you would want to do that. But in, I mean, here what that boils down to is you have to compute your gravity on shell uh, action in a triangular region like this. So you have various brains inserted at various constant angles and then you are computing just the Euclidean uh, on shell action. Uh, with various boundary terms and so on and so forth. The bottom line is that in all these calculations, you do see uh, the, the phase transition between heating and non-heating as a uh, change in free energy of the system. Even with defects? Sorry? Even with this defect? Yes, e with this defects, it becomes clearly like a fr uh, free energy, uh, uh, like a first order phase transition that we are used to in some sense. Okay, so comments? Well, as I tried to, uh, uh, probably tell you that uh, with, uh, with a simple SL2R drive, you get some, at least some interesting physical scenarios appearing here. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, um, uh, you, you, might, uh, you might say that, and quite rightly, that, uh, well, uh, a much more uh, richer physics is perhaps expected when you go away from this SL2R uh, 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 subalgebra and include the Virasoro, at least some of it. And it is indeed so, it's some of the things that we're trying to, trying to calculate now. And in fact, the, uh, you can also, you know, uh, this end of the world brand uh, that, I, uh, that I just inserted without much motivation, it's actually related to in the boundary, uh, in, in the CFT inserting actually boundary objects and, uh, you know, in, uh, 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 that allows you to define something called a boundary entropy, which has some interesting properties and so on and so forth that you can study under this transition. And there are other technical aspects which I'll ignore. Well, as I said that there's an ADS2 foliation that emerges quite naturally from this. And you might be, might be keen on or curious about whether there is a, there's a more detailed connection with doubly holographic models uh, because that's what it seems to be appearing here. And, uh, and also, since all we need here is a global part of the conformal group in, in what, what I just said, you might wonder whether uh, something similar might happen in, in higher dimensions. The answer seems to be yes, it's a bit more complicated, uh, but uh, that's what we are trying to work out. So thank you, thanks a lot for your attention. Questions? I, I, I doubt that because uh, because the, the boundary Hamiltonian is really just this L0, L plus, L1 and L minus 1, right? So I'm not, ex I mean, I'm not expecting any asymptotic, uh, so, so what I'm expecting is some, some ADS3 uh, uh, in, in the bulk, which will evaluate in both phases for me the same answer because it's just, a, uh, it's just ADS3. There's nothing else inserted into it, right? And also no, uh, no. Yes, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, uh, let, let me say I don't know. I, I, I mean, anyways, that's the correct answer. I don't know, but uh, um, yeah. I don't know. I th yeah, that, that can be done though. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That can be done. Yes. Yeah. So the brains with respect to which you computed the free energy. Yeah. The free energy difference. I mean, uh, were they points in ADS3 or? or they extend to some? They extend uh, all the way, uh, I mean, so they, they are extended along the radial direction of the, of, the, of the ADS. If you wish, you know, this picture, uh, I did not probably explain very well, 
but you know if you are, if you look at the Poincare patch of ADS, this Z is the radial direction, and the brains are literally extended along this. So tau is one of the yeah tau is one of the, there's tau and there is another coordinate of course which I'm not showing, but the brains are extended along Z. Okay. Thank you. These are. At this point, they're just, uh, you know, end of the world brains are kind of agnostic. Could be strings also. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're two dimensional. Yeah. They are, yeah. They are time plus one. That's right. Yes. Okay. So, um. all right, let me, so there, there are several things, you see, uh, so, okay, uh, I don't know where I mentioned, but anyway, let me just quick, uh, oh, the cross ratio, yes, good, so the cross ratio, you see, good, so if you want to do this calculation on the bulk, the way we have the bulk, you have to, all right, let me just do it this way. See, you have a bulk here where only, as I said, only phi equal to constant gives you an ADS2 black hole, which is where you will get a non-trivial uh, uh, out of time ordered correlator. So, so, so for example, if you, so these coordinates are related non-trivially to x and tau and so on. So, it, so wh when you do this bulk calculations for out of time ordered correlators, what you do is you, is you throw in stuff uh, throw in, let's say, uh, uh, high energy particles, massless particles, which go in and back react and things like that. So you have to throw them in along these directions at constant phi. Because these are related non-trivially to x, you can get a non-trivial spatial profile. That is not visible in these coordinates. So if I have to rewrite this in the x coordinate, this will be horrendous looking, maybe not horrendous, but involved looking expression. I have a kind of comment and a question. So suppose if you do it not in a CFT but in a one on the quantum dot or SYK type system, uh, and then you allow also for you know like some Hawking radiation to get out, like in sort of AEMM type of models, this should be still a computable thing, right? Or some kind of like with al allowing some. You mean in, in you mean uh, from the geomet from the holographic? Uh yeah, in the holographic uh, thing. Perhaps yes. Um, and uh, so, if you here you have some kind of a drive uh, plus some radiation, so together you could might get into some interesting phases, which are like time crystal like. Or uh, so 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 uh, okay. So so first of all, time crystal is a tricky thing. Uh, uh, with, with CFT, it's not clear you can get it, but. Um, but if you allow for radiation to happen, so you can balance the black hole by some something that is falling in and something that is coming out they can balance out or something maybe perhaps so so are, are you saying that by choosing a particular or the right kind of profile yeah it might be possible uh, i mean yes yeah, so th there is no no go uh, statement in this context for sure yeah, that could be interesting um, yes it could be interesting uh, there are some other completely unrelated stuff also which seems to be happening quite naturally here for example things like uh, things like scar states mm -hmm. so there are certain states in uh, quantum mechanical systems uh, which are called scar states that don't that kind of resist thermalization if you wish so they're mm -hmm. sort of a rebellious state in an otherwise thermalizing so system no, 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 not about, I'm not talking, not even talking about geometry, I'm talking about purely in CFT, let's in forget CFT, about geometry. Yeah, yeah. In geometry, I do not yet know exactly what the right way to say it, but in CFT, where the calculations are very simple, it seems that you can get those states also. Uh, uh, in both, I mean, in this setup also, where you drive a system, you get the heating phase, you get the non-heating phase, in the heating phase, you can write down states which will not heat up. You can identify states, so that's like a scar state. So, and for, for to realize those, you don't need a lot more than what I just told you. Mm -hmm. What is the geometric description of it? That's another layer of which I have no, uh, right now, no, I have interest. I have no, uh, I'm saying it's, it's interesting. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, no, nothing okay. intelligent to say at this point. Okay, so let's thank uh, Arnova for this fantastic talk and uh, thank you.
it's time to have the next one from Rajesh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next speaker is Rajesh Gupta from IIT Ropa. He will tell us about defects, boundary, and disorder in non-relativistic systems. Okay, uh, many thanks. Uh, first of all, um, um, I thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, having this uh, wonderful workshop. So um, I'm going to speak about some work uh, which uh, I have I did with uh, my students, uh, um, Prit Singh and Minu. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, is some non-relativistic systems, uh, uh, defects or dis boundary and disorder. Um, but before uh, going ahead, I apologize to the organizers that in my talk, there'll be neither black holes nor gaze theory. and maybe a very slight holography <laughs> and I'm not so sure about the last word <laughs> so as long as you enlighten about <laughs> enlighten us about all these things is fine okay uh, yeah anyway so uh, so let me start with a, a very brief uh, introduction so um, we all are um, aware of this fact uh, especially we all of us like um, um, symmetries and uh, symmetries in physics uh, have played a very important role um, because when we have uh, symmetries in a problem, uh, that helps us um, uh, not only uh, to simplify the problem, but also to make many uh, statements about the uh, system, okay, any particular system. So one of the symmetry um, which we uh, like here is a scale symmetry, and that's of course, um, um, it's, uh, it's um, whether it's high, whether it be high energy physicist or condensed matter or statistical physics. So scale symmetry uh, plays a, a, a very important role in all these things. And a specific, a special case of this scale symmetry, uh, which we hear uh, s several times in this workshop, is a conformal symmetry. So, um, so most of the uh, conformal uh, uh, conform field theory, uh, which we uh, heard in this uh, workshop, or which we uh, most of the time we work with is what I'm going to call it relativistic conformal field theory. Um, and in that uh, case, what happens that, that uh, space and time are at the same footing. At least if you consider scale transformation, space and time have the same scale. But another cl uh, class of conformal field theory, um, uh, which has been studied, um, but not as uh, much as, sorry, but not as much as the relativistic conformal field theory, is the one where space and time have different scaling, okay? And this gives rise to what is something called the anisotropic exponent. Okay, so for example, if you can say two-point function, um, so rather than uh, time and uh, uh, spatial uh, space coordinate is scaling in the same manner, there is some factor theta. Um, so time is scales slightly different than the uh, uh, space uh, space coordinate. And theta not being one, uh, if a system we have uh, where theta is not being equal to one, then it's called a strongly anisotropic system. I would like to emphasize here that um, here I'm considering only one kind of anisotropy uh, where time and uh, uh, space have a, this kind of behavior, but there are uh, other kind of anisotropy as well. For example, one could also introduce anisotropy among the spatial coordinates, okay? So, but that uh, I'm not going to focus on. So I'm going to focus on uh, this kind of situation, in particular, situation where this anisotropy critical exponent uh, theta equal to two, okay? Such a system um, uh, uh, is a, uh, has a scale invariance, as we see, and that can be uh, also described, uh, that can be described, the underlying symmetry uh, which describes such a system is called the Schrodinger symmetry, and such a field theory is, uh, we call the Schrodinger invariant field theory. And I will call this uh, non relativistic conformity. So in my talk, uh, when I was speaking about non relativistic conform field theory, so I will talk about uh, Schrodinger invariant symmetry. Okay, now, uh, what is my motivation? Why I'm interested in studying uh, this non relativistic conform field theory? So um, my motivation um, started with uh, when I came across this unitary Fermi gas. So uh, although this is just a simple n-body quantum mechanics, not simple, uh, I would not say it is a simple problem, but it is some n-body quantum mechanics problem. Uh, and there are a lot of physics to it, which uh, I, uh, I don't understand. Um, so I may, I may not answer all your question if there are. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I will um, connect it with the non relativistic conform filter in a moment. So um, this unity Fermi gas is uh, some kind of a, a, a ultra cold system, a system of uh, fermionic atoms, and uh, um, by uh, so these are uh, uh, very low uh, uh, dilute gases, and you have cooled down quite low temperature, 
And what you do uh, by applying some external field, uh, you can tune uh, their interactions and such that uh, it hits the unitarity limit. Okay? What it means that you can uh, make the scattering length to infinity or let's say partial wave scattering amplitude uh, um, uh, saturating the maximum allowed value. So in terms of wave function, uh, this unitarity limit, what it corresponds to is that, that if you consider this uh, n-body wave functions, then uh, when two of the uh, particles come uh, closer, um, uh, keeping all other particles, let's say, fixed uh, to their position, then the wave function has this kind of behavior. Okay, so uh, so this is what we uh, call the unitary Fermi systems, and uh, what experimentalists can do uh, um, with this uh, unitary Fermi system that they can store it, uh, they can store it in a harmonic trap. How do they do that? That I, that I don't know, but uh, they can uh, store it in a harmonic trap. They can create uh, this kind of harmonic trap, and they can um, uh, study uh, this system uh, uh, in the harmonic trap. And what uh, is an uh, important question in this area, uh, in this field, is that what are the energy eigenvalues uh, of this uh, uh, harmonic system in harmonic trap? It's still, it, uh, this question is still an unsolved problem. Uh, although this harmonic system, uh, this kind of ultra cool system has been achieved quite a long time back, uh, but still it is an unsolved problem that what are the energy eigenvalues uh, uh, in this harmonic trap? Now, Ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, so I and J is the i and J uh, atom, fermionic atom, and capital I J is center of mass. So what I'm doing is that I'm center of mass fixed, but their separation I'm reducing. So R I J is separation between I and J, and capital R I J is the center of mass coordinate for I and J. No, this is just a, st a statement that uh, uh, when you hit the scattering length infinity. So for example, let's suppose if you consider two body p uh, problem, or two particle scattering, um, uh, then um, if you look at uh, the S wave uh, um, uh, wave function, uh, the amplitude, um, then the wave function will have this kind of behavior or minus some kind of one over A. And uh, when you take A goes to infinity, so this is the wave function we have. Is this fine? Yeah. So when the uh, spatial separation between the two system approaches zero, um, in the unitarity limit, the wave function has this kind of behavior. Yeah, one over R, exactly. Okay, um, so um, what I'm uh, uh, talking about that this energy eigenvalue problem uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this harmonic trap, and what one can do, uh, at least uh, theoretically, one can understand this system as if, uh, so we can't, uh, still we don't know the energy eigenvalue, but what we can realize is that the, all these spectrums can be organized as a family of ladders, okay? With, uh, so with uh, each, and each ladder has a lowest some energy eigenstate, and then um, all the other energy eigenstates uh, in that uh, family, in that ladder, can be, opt uh, can be obtained by acting some creation operator. So if you know the uh, lowest energy eigenvalue, then we can obtain, uh, so we, if you know all the uh, lowest energy eigenvalues, um, I energy, then we can obtain uh, the, all the energy eigenvalue of the system. And so this is where non-relativistic conform field it comes in. Um, so what one realizes that, so this uh, problem in the harmonic trap, uh, which is not a conform field theory because there's a harmonic trap, this problem can be mapped to a system of unitary Fermi gas, but in a free space. In particular, all these lowest energy eigenvalues map to uh, primary operators, or in other words, the scaling dimension of the primary operator in non-relativistic conform field theory becomes the energy eigenvalue, this lowest energy eigenvalue. So in other words, if we know uh, this unitary Fermi gas in the free uh, space, if we can solve um, uh, this non-relativistic conform field theory, and if you obtain the primary operators, uh, scaling dimension of these primary operators, then we know what are the energy eigenvalues uh, by this correspondence, by this relation, and we can solve this problem, okay? So that's my motivation here, uh, to understand what is this non-relativistic conform field theory, and can we say something about uh, uh, this one? Okay, okay, all the, this is my motivation, but, uh, and this is uh, um, uh, uh, what I want to understand, but, this is not what I'm going to solve, or at least uh, at least for today's, uh, um, this is not what I'm going to present. What I'm going to uh, present uh, is uh, um, understanding at least non-relativistic conform field theory, because, uh, because for me what I realized that, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
we have learned a lot about a conform field theory in a various situations, but in non-relativity conform field theory, there has very little work has been done in at least uh, uh, to understand um, um, as many aspects of what we have done in the relativistic conform field theory. So, um, so what I'm going to study uh, two uh, two distinct system, two di uh, two distinct physical system which I'm going to study. Uh, they are distinct, however, but there will be some uh, um, some thing which are common. And what I'm going to uh, um, do here is basically um, I will start with a, uh, some uh, critical theory, some non-relativistic conform field theory, and then try to deform it by breaking some underlying symmetry, one of the some underlying symmetry, and see whether we uh, flow uh, to some new universality class or some new uh, non-relativistic conform field theory. And what is the property of this new uh, non-relativistic conform field theory? So in that regard, first, first uh, uh, deformation which I'm going to talk about uh, is like a defects in boundary, more precisely about the boundary. So um, the motivation for this is that, that um, so in quantum field theory, uh, as we know, we, uh, whenever we talk about, we usually talk about uh, uh, local operators and their correlation functions. But what we have uh, been learning is that, that um, uh, so extended object or what we call defects or, or boundary are also important if you want to explore quantum field theory. So when you come to uh, uh, the defect, um, actually, um, so there's no, okay, for me, I don't find any precise definition of a defect, what is a precise definition of a defect in a quantum field theory. But basically, the, one can take a general understanding, we can have a general understanding about the defect. Basically, it is like a, a, some quantum, a, whatever quantum field theory we have, and we couple this quantum field theory to some another quantum field theory, uh, which is living on a, some sub-manifold of the space-time. This uh, coupling introduces a defect in my uh, in my system. Of course, one can extend this definition to also include other kind of defect, for example, toothed operator, etc. But I'm not going to talk about those. Okay. Okay. So, um, so one, uh, so of course, as we know that they play an important role in string theory, condensed matter. For example, D-brains is uh, D-brains are one kind of defects, um, and then similarly in. Uh, condensed matter, et cetera, like condo problem. Um, we have a, um, a very important problem in the condensed matter. Um, so one uh, important uh, common thing about defect or any uh, boundary is that, that uh, uh, they break uh, symmetries of the, as I was saying, that they break symmetries of the bulk theory. For example, uh, one simplest symmetry which uh, they are breaking is a uh, translation symmetry perpendicular to the defect or perpendicular to the boundary, okay? So actually, um, so what one would like to understand that if we have introduced this such a kind of deformation, uh, then what is the, um, uh, how does this defect or uh, introduces, uh, um, so how does this defect changes the uh, properties of the system, okay? The long distance property of the system, okay? So even, in fact, uh, um, many of the times what happened that even if the bulk uh, to start with, uh, is, uh, let's suppose if, uh, we start with some bulk theory, which is critical, that is describe a conform field theory, then what one can see is that the, if you introduce, let's say, defect or let's say, boundary, that is still leads to a, some non-trivial renormalization group flow, and that can lead to a new uh, conform boundary conditions, okay? Okay, so, um, so this is a, a what deformation I'm going to talk about uh, uh, as a first system. Another deformation which I'm going to talk about is what I call the uh, especially random disorder. So, um, so what is, so especially random disorder is also uh, physically relevant. Basically, you can think of like uh, my physical system, uh, and you have uh, doped this system with some random impurities, okay? And then uh, one question arises uh, that how does this uh, impurities uh, affect the physical property of the system, okay? Whether they lead to the uh, um, different um, uh, long distance behavior or uh, they, uh, or anyway, means uh, how does this affect the uh, property of the system, okay? So uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, something uh, called the quench disorder. So this uh, disorder are the kind of disorder which are non-dynamical, okay? So I'm going to consider a disorder uh, which uh, don't have a time evolutions. Uh, and this is what in the literature are called the quench disorder. Furthermore, uh, I'm going to assume, uh, furthermore, I'm going to as, uh, consider this to be a random disorder. Basically, what it means that, that um, so, um, okay, sorry. So one simplest example um, where we can think of this uh, random disorder, for example, uh, is like, a, if you can say, Ising model, and you leave uh, one of the site uh, vacant, okay? But which site you leave it vacant, uh, that is uh, random, okay? So that uh, uh, is like a, a random disorder. 
So when you think of in terms of continuum field theory, or let's say a quantum field theory, um, and if you uh, want to describe this uh, disorder, so typically what it does, um, so uh, uh, we have, uh, so we, it introduces um, some random coupling, okay, which uh, breaks the uh, homogeneity of the space-time, homogeneity of the symmetries, and this random coupling coupled to some kind of some operators, some local operators, okay. So this uh, uh, disorder, as you see, uh, breaks the underlying homogeneous, uh, homogeneity of the space-time. And then now question arises that uh, 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 how does uh, this disorder uh, affects the um, uh, uh, universal property of the system? Furthermore, I will assume that this disorder to be random in the sense that um, uh, they take the value from a probability distribution, PFH. And uh, I'm going to assume uh, 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 that this uh, disorder field are such that, that the uh, at any point, they mean to be zero, and the variance is given by this. Okay, so basically, what this uh, tells you that that uh, the disorder at any point um, in the space time can fluctuate independent of each other. Okay, uh, sorry, v is uh, some just a disorder strength, some constant. Okay. And uh, okay, so this is uh, important because uh, as we'll see in a moment, um, uh, that this V plays a role of uh, uh, disorder coupling. And we'll see that, that uh, I'll give an example, uh, an explicit example, where we see that even if this disorder coupling uh, is small, um, uh, a very small number, it can lead a system to, um, it can destroy the original ordered phase of the system, okay? So that's what uh, uh, um, uh, we are going to uh, see in a moment, okay? So uh, before uh, going ahead, uh, so uh, I thought that let's me first review what we uh, uh, understand about non-relativistic conformal symmetry. So, uh, so when we study relativistic conformal group, so basically it is a, a group of transformation uh, which are symmetric group of massless Klingor equation. Okay, so this that means that you have uh, uh, transformations, a uh, space-time transformation which maps a solution of Klingor equation to another solution. So if following the same line, one can introduce a non-relativistic analog of uh, this relativistic conformal symmetry, and that's what we call the Schrodinger symmetry. And that is uh, uh, transformations, which uh, is invariance of Schrodinger equation, okay, free Schrodinger equation. So uh, basically, uh, so um, it maps a sol uh, solution of free Schrodinger equation to another solution, okay. It consists of, uh, um, so I, I will mention uh, in the next slide, I will uh, show it explicitly uh, what are these uh, uh, symmetries, uh, what are the generators, but basically it consists of Galilean transformations, uh, dilatations, and expansion transformation. I'll mention in a moment uh, what are the actions. And if you look at three spatial dimension, that is three spatial dimension, or of course one time dimension, so this comes out to a 12 parameter group, okay? So uh, as you notice here that, that if you have compare, if you compare this uh, with a relativistic uh, conformal field theory, then usually relativist, uh, so a relativistic conformal field theory has 15 parameter group in three plus one dimension. And from there you see that, that it has a less number of a generator and would, one would expect that, that it is less constraining. I mean, in the sense that if you use this symmetries uh, to say something about the system, then it is less constraining. However, we will see in a moment that uh, um, all that is less constraining, but even then we can say, make a, some different statement about the system. Okay. Now, another important thing here is that, that uh, you see there's a mass here, um, and uh, naively one would expect that, okay, in the relativistic conformal uh, field theory, when we have mass, then we know that it, uh, it breaks the conformal invariance. So one would expect that uh, there is a mass here, so how it is a uh, 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 conformal here. Basically, <coughs> although uh, there's a mass, but one should understand this, that the speed of light is not there. I mean, it is taken to infinity, okay? So therefore, there's no relation between mass and the length, okay? And therefore, we can keep a mass fixed and scale the length coordinates, okay? So therefore, that's why. Um, um, the mass is also the central charge. Yeah, yeah, mass is also central charge. Yeah. So I'll s show you the uh, algebra in a moment. Uh, so this, is this related to something about N and I got properly explained? No, no. This mass. No, no. Exactly. Okay. This mass is part of the uh, Schrodinger equation anyway. Also, uh, in the in the second kind of uh, disorder which you uh, described, in what ways uh, the symmetries are broken? I mean, you see that, that uh, let's suppose if we start with uh, S0, which is like a uh, um, uh, conformal symmetry, let's suppose whatever uh, homogeneous ac uh, action it is, let's suppose it describes a pure system. And what I'm trying to do it is, I mean, perturbing this system by some disorder, okay? 
So usually homogeneous system, this has a translation invariance, but you see that this part will not have a translation invariance because coupling constant is function of x. So some of the translation symmetry is broken here, actually. Okay. Um, so th yeah, so they have done uh, work at the large in CFTs, yeah. yeah, yeah, so they have done work in, the, but not in this, yeah, non-relativistic experimentary, yeah. Sorry, sorry? No, no, yeah, yeah. So this is not a, uh, this is, uh, has been, yeah, so this deformation has been studied. Uh, even if condensed matter people have been studied before also. That's true, that's true. So I'm going to talk about uh, one specific system, actually, in fact, unitary Fermi system. And there, what I want to study the how this disorder affects the unitary Fermi system. Okay, yeah. But you're right. I mean, this is not a new stuff. This is very old stuff, actually, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so what I, um, um, so let me uh, describe the action of this uh, um, various symmetry transmission. So Galilean tra uh, transmission, we think of it consists of rotation, uh, boost, and uh, uh, translation, and also time translation. Uh, then scale transmission uh, is like uh, uh, x and t going to like lambda x and lambda square t. And then the expansion transformation is given by this one. Okay, so expansion transformation has very similar structure like a special conformal transformation, basically like i, h, i, uh, where i is some inversion map, H is a trans Hamiltonian, which is generate time translation. Okay, so only except the dif uh, so the difference when you think of uh, if you think of number of generators compared to relativistic case, actually the difference comes here because uh, we have only one expansion uh, generator. I mean, uh, in, in, unlike in the uh, relativistic case, so this expansion is very similar to special conformal transformation, but except uh, but now we have only one. Okay, we can think of it as a, like temporal part of a uh, special conformal transformation. And this transformation is symmetry of the Schrodinger equation uh, with the action uh, on the Schrodinger field given by this one, okay? Okay, so um, when it now think of, uh, uh, let's suppose, uh, now we can think of the algebra. Um, so what is the algebra of this uh, uh, Schrodinger uh, symmetry? So this algebra uh, we can obtain um, just by finding the commutation relation between various generators. So um, we have this uh, algebra. Um, uh, so this algebra consists of uh, like, uh, uh, so this is PI is a translation generator, KJ uh, is a boost generator. So uh, we have this, all this computation relation. The important thing here is this one, uh, which as Ayan has pointed out, uh, that uh, this is a central extension, uh, what we call the central extension of the Galilean symmetry. And this N is what we call the particle number generator, okay? So particle number uh, is also a symmetry in the non-relativistic case, and the uh, particle number generator also appears in the uh, in the extent, as a central extension of the Galilean algebra. Okay. 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 So now let me come to the representation of uh, of uh, this Schrodinger algebra. So we, so again we proceed in a similar manner as we do in the relativistic conform field theory. Basically, we start with the uh, 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 fixed point uh, of the. Uh, uh, of this, so okay, basically we start with the operators, um, primary operators, um, and then uh, uh, once we have a primary operators, then we can uh, uh, construct the representation uh, by starting the primary operators and their descendants, okay? So uh, the primary operators are defined like this. So the primary operators are eigenstate of uh, our dilatation operator, uh, which is eigenvalue delta, and uh, they carry, uh, so now we have a particle number symmetry, as I said, so all the operators will have a, a definite particle number. So that's the what I call M, or that's what you're calling the mass, actually. Uh, and then uh, they are annihilated by the boost generator and expansion generator. Basically, this boost and expansion uh, uh, decreases the dimension. They, they decrease the dimension, a uh, scaling dimension of the operator O. So for example, boost generate, uh, uh, decreases the dimension uh, by one unit, and the expansion uh, decreases the dimension by two units, okay? So in other words, if I start with any, uh, operator and if you keep on applying this boost and expansion, then uh, if we assume that uh, uh, we have a dimension uh, bounded from below, okay? So then we hit upon an operator which is annihilated by this boost and expansion generator, okay? And these operators, what we call the primary operators, okay? And then uh, uh, like uh, we do in the relativistic case, uh, we have a descendants. Uh, so the de descendants are built by here by uh, action of a momentum generator and the Hamiltonian. So momentum generator, C is an expansion generator, okay? Uh, so um, 
this uh, momentum generator uh, increases the dimension by one unit, and the Hamiltonian generator increases the dimension by two units. Okay, so and this is how. So given a primary operators, uh, we can build uh, um, uh, 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 all the descent by applying uh, p and h. Okay. Okay. Now we come to the uh, uh, correlation functions. So, um, so I was emphasizing um, that uh, we have. Uh, so, you, so like in the relativistic case, we can fix the. Uh, uh, correlation function at least uh, up to three point functions. Uh, four point function we can uh, we cannot fix completely up to, uh, because there are crosses here, a component invariant cross ratio. So here what we uh, can do is similar thing. Uh, what we find that that if we uh, uh, use the conformal Schrodinger symmetry, what one finds that the one point function uh, turn out to be zero, which is very similar to uh, what relativistic conformal theory we had, and the two point function can be also completely fixed. Uh, which is given in terms of their mass. So this m1, m2 are mass number of m1, uh, mass number of O1 and O2. Okay, so this uh, one and two point function completely fixed. However, uh, unlike the relativistic case, three point function we cannot completely fix. Okay, so three point function is coming out to be like this quantity, uh, uh, and it is determined up to a function of some v, where v is this uh, confirming variant cross ratio. So uh, this is where the difference lies from the relativistic and non-relativistic. Uh, this less number of generator here, um, we uh, so we cannot fix three-point function uh, completely. Okay. 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 So now, uh, so this was uh, just a review uh, of, uh, um, I mean, it, uh, a review of Schrodinger uh, symmetry and the representation. So what I'm going to study, uh, uh, what I'm going to uh, do is that I uh, study the effect of boundary. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm assuming that that um, um, uh, when we have already uh, critical theory, even in presence of boundary, and then try to see that uh, uh, how does this correlation functions uh, are modified, and what we can learn uh, about various correlation functions. So basically, what I'm going to consider here uh, is uh, let's suppose um, uh, I place a boundary uh, at one, uh, at the origin of one of the coordinates, say let's say y, y runs from zero to infinity here, and I have all the spatial coordinates, which is x. Okay, x vector, and the bulk coordinate cons uh, consists of t and x, where x consists of x vector and y. Okay, so the x vector is a boundary coordinate, and then the bulk coordinate is t comma x. And what we want to understand, uh, uh, so uh, so because of this, as I said, because of this presence of boundary, uh, as we see immediately, that the uh, translation symmetry, which is perpendicular boundary, is broken. But not only translation symmetry, the other symmetry is also broken. For example, if we consider boost. Uh, perpendicular boundary that is also broken, and the rotation mixing the boundary and bulk coordinate that's also broken. Okay, but nevertheless, still we have some uh, transformation which are left over. So, for example, um, now the symmetry which we have in presence of a boundary is a rotation in the boundary coordinates, uh, boost in the uh, boundary coordinates, uh, v vector, and similarly translation in the boundary coordinate. Time translation is anyway there; uh, it's not broken. Scale transformation is also there. So uh, here I'm putting the boundary at y equal to zero. So this is uh, uh, preserved by this scale transformation, and also uh, my uh, expansion transformation is also preserved. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, so we want to see that. Uh, so uh, our conformal symmetry, whatever we started with, um, uh, is broken because of the presence of boundary. Um, so we have less number of uh, generator. And, uh, and therefore, again, um, so uh, as we have uh, seen uh, earlier, so when we have less number of generators, so uh, we have less constraining equation. So nevertheless, let's proceed and see how far we can go, uh, what we can say. So we want to obtain the correlation function now uh, under this uh, reduced symmetry. So uh, basic idea would be uh, start with your primary operators and uh, uh, obtain the uh, uh, obtain the water entities for various correlation function and try to solve those water entities. Okay. So we have uh, so we so however uh, since we have a boundary uh, the things are still much richer because uh, now we will have a correlation function not only on between bulk and bulk but also uh, there are operators which are on the boundary so therefore there will be a, also a correlation function between bulk and boundary and boundary and boundary okay so the correlation functions now will have much richer structure uh, than the previously so we st so, okay so uh, so basic idea would be again the same thing that you start with the uh, your action of whatever the reduced uh, uh, generator you have on the primary operators, and use that action to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to obtain the correlation functions. Okay, so uh, so I'll just mention the results here. Basically, these all these results can be obtained by just solving the water entities. 
Uh, so first uh, is that that if you look at any primary operator, bulk primary operator, it turns out uh, that uh, now it, uh, one point function is not equal to zero. Okay, uh, it is given by uh, this uh, y, where y is the distance from the boundary, and delta is the scaling dimension of the operator. Okay, now a uh, two point function when it comes to the two point function uh, is not completely fixed, so. Uh, as so three, earlier we had a uh, three-point function is not completely fixed, but now it's going to turn out that two-point function is not completely fixed. And they are not fixed up to a function of uh, g of xi, where xi is uh, this cross ratio. Okay. Actually, th this is very similar to uh, the similar kind of structure we also obtain in the relativistic uh, conform field theory, where xi is slightly different, which is again y and y2 divided by x1 minus x2 whole square. Okay, here, um, uh, so x1 and x2 uh, is a bulk distance between the two operators. Interestingly, here what appears is not uh, a bulk distance, but just a time difference, okay. Now, uh, so this is a uh, two-point function of the bulk primary operators. One can also obtain uh, the two-point function between bulk and boundary primary operators, okay. So this two-point function can be completely fixed, uh, which has this kind of structure. And uh, a boundary to boundary uh, two point function also completely fixed, which it has this kind of structure. Which is exactly, this one is very similar to uh, uh, the two point function what we had um, uh, without boundary. Okay. Okay. So um, this relation is Im Im important because this relation suggests that that uh, they uh, so this is a relation between the uh, correlation function between bulk and boundary primary operator, and this relation suggests that that. Um, at least near the boundary, uh, one can have a, some kind of uh, as expansion of this bulk operator in terms of boundary operators. Okay, so um, so uh, if we start with some kind of ansatz uh, of uh, the bulk primary operators uh, in terms of boundary primary operators, and just feed in in uh, these correlation functions, and uh, also taking uh, the boundary boundary correlation function to, to be have this form, then what one finds that the near the boundary, a bulk primary operator has a falling expansion in terms of boundary primary operators, okay? So all these, uh, these are some coefficient uh, which cannot be fixed. However, the other coefficient are given by this one, which are determined by the scaling dimension of boundary primary operators. And these operators which appear is just something about Schrodinger operator, uh, uh, which is given by this one. And uh, one important thing here that uh, all it is some of all pri boundary primary operators, but uh, uh, they both boundary primary operators and bulk primary carry the same particle number. Okay, now this expansion uh, become uh, simpler um, um, for the, uh, so this is expansion of uh, all uh, possible boundary primary operator. And this expansion can truncate if you have, uh, uh, if, it's, if my bulk primary operator satisfies certain condition. For example, um, if I take the bulk primary operator uh, solving Schrodinger equation, free Schrodinger equation, and has a scaling dimension d over two, then it turns out that this expansion truncate it contains only two uh, confirmed families. One corresponds to a scaling dimension d over two, and another corresponds d over two plus one. Okay, so basically, uh, this uh, so these two uh, boundary confirmed family um, just corresponds to like uh, 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 so this operator uh, evaluated on on the bulk bulk operator evaluated on, sorry bulk operator evaluated on the boundary, and d by two plus one corresponds to normal derivative of the bulk operator on the boundary. Okay. And how much time do you have? Uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so this is the uh, uh, expansion uh, we have. Um, so now we see here that um, we have a bulk bulk uh, primary operator correlation functions uh, which are uh, we have determined, but only up to some unknown function. On the other hand, <coughs> sorry. On the other hand, uh, we now have um, expansion of a bulk primary operator in terms of boundary primary operators. Furthermore, we know what is the correlation function between boundary boundary primary operators, okay? So using these three informations, one can obtain uh, the expression of uh, this quantity in terms of boundary data, okay? So in particular, uh, what one finds that um, if we use this, uh, uh, all this information, uh, that is um, uh, the boundary expansion and uh, the fact that my uh, boundary boundary um, operator correlation function satis uh, satis is satisfying this one, one obtain uh, the form of this g of j. Okay, so this g of j is given in terms of uh, uh, this uh, function. This is also called the boundary conform block. Uh, it's, it's much simpler than the what appears in the relativistic conform 
theory, uh, it's just a simple as 0 f1 hypergeometric function. Uh, and uh, uh, so one can obtain, uh, the, uh, so one has this expansion, uh, so one has this expression of uh, g of j in terms of boundary data, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so uh, now actually, okay, so this much I wanted to say about uh, uh, this uh, boundary conform field theories. Uh, next, I'm drastically going to change my topic. Uh, and Uh, there are two F1 appears F1. actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, I'm now going to drastic change uh, to another deformation. Okay, uh, and this is what um, uh, uh, what I emphasized earlier. So um, what I'm going to talk about um, is, as I was saying, that uh, um, disorder um, deformation, and I'm going to uh, focus on a specific model. Uh, so instead of working, uh, instead of giving a general discussion, I'm going to focus on a very specific system, which is a unitary Fermi system, uh, which is given by this, which is just, if, if you forget about this piece, then uh, this action uh, describes um, the, uh, it, it belongs to the same universality class as a unitary Fermi system, okay? Uh, so uh, I'm going to consider a very simplest operator, uh, um, phi dagger phi, uh, which are disorder coupled to. There can be some other operator, but uh, there are some other operator which one can introduce to couple uh, the disorder field. But for the presentation uh, purpose, I will just uh, consider just one operator. And um, this uh, this has an uh, interesting uh, situation that, um, so if you consider uh, this uh, deformation, then this deformation, uh, there's something called the Harris criteria. Basically what it says, that this deformation is marginal if d equal to four, that is four spatial dimension and uh, one time, uh, so four spatial direction, and there's also time direction. And this becomes relevant in d equal to four minus epsilon, okay? In other words, um, uh, if you work in epsilon expansion, and then eventually if you take epsilon goes to one, which uh, um, uh, is physically relevant, then we can say something about the my real physical system, okay? So d equal to three spatial dimension. So furthermore, um, as I said that this disorder uh, takes value from a probability distribution. Uh, so I'm going to assume um, uh, the probability distribution, uh, which is Gaussian. Um, and uh, so next what uh, we want to do is that uh, we want to compute, uh, so, uh, so this is our setup. So we have this action and this is our probability distribution. And what we want to uh, do is in this model computes various quantities, um, average quantity, okay? So which are averaging over this probability distribution. So for example, if you want to compute the free energy, average free energy, so what we want to do is to compute the free energy for a given profile of the disorder, and then uh, integrate over the, um, uh, the disorder field with this probability distribution, okay? Now, this calculation is much harder in the sense that, that uh, for every, value, every uh, disorder field computing the free energy and then averaging over is much more harder. But then there is a trick, which is a replica trick uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this field which can be employed uh, and which can simplify at, at least to some extent. Um, uh, of course, it doesn't, uh, it comes with the cost, which I'll mention in a moment, uh, but at least some computation it can simplify. So basically in the, uh, in the replica trick, what we do, we consider n copies of the original system for a given disorder for profile, uh, for a given disorder profile H, and then we uh, the average about the disorder field. Okay, so this come out as a, uh, n here is integer, so this come out as a function of uh, uh, integer n, but as we also uh, do in entanglement entropy, et cetera, um, so I'm going to assume that uh, one can analytically continue for uh, all real values of n. So um, if we can analytically continue, then the, uh, we can obtain the disorder average free energy by differentiating with respect to n and then taking limit n goes to zero, okay? So, um, so this is, uh, so, uh, uh, so th the replica trick, uh, so this is in the replica trick, um, what happens here is that, that now the f average free energy, so in, in the sense, okay, so this simplifies uh, our like uh, in, in the sense that now what we can do, we can integrate out, uh, instead of integrating first the all my degrees of freedom, we first now integrate the over disorder field and write down the uh, path integral over the rec replica fields. Okay, so therefore now my whole computation uh, in the replica trick reduces to some path integral computation. Of course, now the number of uh, fields we have increased, uh, n number of replicas, and there is some replicated action. Okay, so um, 
Okay, so this is, uh, uh, and of course, uh, once we have this average free energy, then we can uh, compute also other thermodynamic quantities uh, by differentiating this free energy. Uh, and then we can uh, obtain the disordered average um, uh, thermodynamic variables or thermodynamic quantity of interest. Now, what I'm interested in uh, is to compute the disordered average correlation functions, okay? Basically, uh, what, uh, uh, what we want to do is that if you know the correlation function of my operators for a given disorder pro uh, profile, then uh, uh, the disorder average correlation function is given by this quantity equation, okay? Again, we can use the replica trick uh, to simplify this uh, calculation. And in that case, what it turns out that uh, the connected part, I'm going to just talk about connected part, and that is uh, enough for me. Uh, so the connected part, uh, the disorder average of connected correlation function can be again uh, uh, given in terms of replica uh, theory. And in that, uh, what happens, uh, what reduces to uh, some computation in replica theory, where now you compute the correlation function of replica invariant operator, okay? So, so you have a, uh, for each O, um, you have a, a corresponding uh, uh, operator uh, with a replica index. And you have to consider a replica invariant, there is some over A. And just the com uh, correlation function of that in the replicated theorem. And again, you do the same thing that analytic continue for re all real values of n and differentiate it and then take limit n goes to zero, okay? So this is, uh, gives you the uh, replicated, uh, sorry, um, uh, disorder average correlation functions. And this, these are oper correlation functions. Uh, so, uh, if we, uh, so, so one, of course, uh, as I emphasizing here, that since, uh, mo uh, of course, other than this part, the rest of this calculation just become like an ordinary path integral quantum field theory calculation. So we can use all the tools of quantum field theory, regularization, renormalization. So, um, uh, so what we're also looking for, that what is the uh, correlation, uh, what is the uh, differential equation satisfied by this renormalized correlation function, okay? Basically, um, uh, this is a generalized, uh, so I will see the structure of this in a, in a moment. But this also called a generalized kalan simanji equation. In a moment, I will show it in an explicit example. So uh, we want to find out what are these uh, uh, various exponents, critical exponents, okay? Okay, now, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, this is what, yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, here I'm coming to this, okay. So, so actually, um, as I said here that, that we got this uh, replicated action. So now let me comment about this uh, replicated action. So as I was saying that, that this uh, re replica trick uh, uh, simplifies our life, but it also comes with certain cost. Um, and it's not a, um, um, uh, its cost is not, uh, it's price you're paying not a, um, uh, it's just a, some uh, technical uh, issues. So, so for example, um, so, uh, okay, so here I am using symbol O, um, O A X T. This is a disorder operator. I mean, in the sense the operator, so instead of phi dagger phi, I'm calling just uh, this O A, O B. Okay, so uh, basically what happens that if you integrate out uh, this uh, disorder uh, uh, field H, then you obtain a replicated action, and the replicated action has this form. This is the effect of uh, in, uh, this extra contribution which uh, comes in uh, is uh, due to the integrating over H, okay? Another thing is that you see that uh, here B, V appears, which was the disorder strength, which I was calling. So it appears like a coupling constant, okay? So now uh, there, uh, so you see uh, this uh, action, and then you see uh, that we have uh, immediately we can see uh, two effects. First is you see that uh, this uh, term, this R term, comes with a wrong sign, with a negative sign. And another thing you see that uh, this this R term is a non-local in time. Okay. However, this is not a big issue actually. Uh, uh, it is it definitely uh, it's a structure, but the uh, point is that that uh, uh, this uh, this is just a technical issue. Basically, um, so what happens that uh, that these terms um, we can organize in two kind of uh, say, uh, two uh, kind of uh, terms, one uh, where a equal to b and another where a not equal to b. Okay, so if let's suppose if we compute the disorder average free energy, then uh, a not equal to b gives you like n square minus n contribution, and since we want to uh, since we are calculating derivative and then taking n goes to zero, so n square minus n. Uh, gives you the correct sign, okay? So when you're differentiating n square minus n with this one, so that gives a correct sign. On the other hand, uh, uh, the term with a equal to b um, has important uh, uh, implication, uh, which I will, um, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a moment, okay? Another thing is that, that uh, uh, 
this our term, uh, which comes, uh, comes here, is a non-local in time. And uh, if you uh, do a perturbative expansion, we di indeed find uh, diagrams where uh, we have extra time integral, and that gives you some uh, divergence, infrared divergence. But actually, okay, so I don't know the general proof of here, but what it turns out in my case is that, that uh, all those uh, extra integrals uh, which come, uh, comes here, they come with extra factor of n. Okay, and they drops out when we take this uh, 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 n goes to zero limit. Okay, so they don't contribute. But I don't know whether this is a, a, a genetic feature or not. Okay, okay. So now let me uh, uh, give you the explicit expression in, uh, in this uh, unitary Fermi system. So, okay, yeah, I'm uh, near. Uh, yeah. So uh, if you consider two point function, let's suppose of uh, just a scalar field. Okay. Then what we find that that uh, the disorder abreast uh, 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 correlation function, two-point function, satisfies the following Kalanzi Maggi equation. Okay, so here uh, beta g and beta lambda. Sorry, uh, this beta lambda. is so lambda is same as v here. Uh, sorry, uh, basically uh, v here is the disorder strength, and lambda here is just the renormalized value of those disorder coupling. So uh, this uh, so uh, so lambda represents the disorderness. Okay, so uh, this is a, this is also called the generalized Kalanzi Maggi equation. This beta g and beta lambda. So here we are doing in epsilon expansion. Uh, so uh, these are the two leading order in epsilon expansion. This is the uh, beta function which we got, and uh, their critical points, uh, fixed point. What we see um, has three fixed points. I'll, in a moment, I will show you some phase uh, diagram uh, of in this coupling cost in a moment. So we find the three uh, fixed points, which is a Gaussian fixed point, which is a pure fixed point where you have uh, no disorder. And there's another interesting fixed point which has a disorder. Okay. Okay. Another interesting aspect uh, is that there is another exponent which appears, critical exponent, which is gamma e, and that uh, is actually related to what I was saying earlier um, when a equal to b terms. Um, and this gamma e uh, is actually depends on this disorder. Okay. In other words, um, um, so this gamma e. So I, I'll mention in a moment what is the effect of this gamma e in a moment, uh, in next slide. But what I'm trying to say that, that uh, at this uh, point, this gamma is zero, but at the disorder fixed point, we have a non-zero value of gamma e, okay? So um, if you now uh, sit at the uh, fixed point of, let's say, coupling uh, constant, okay? Um, that means a beta g and beta lambda equal to zero point, uh, what one find that in a space time, if we convert this kalanzi Maggi equation, and then we integrate this, okay? So then what we find the two-point function has a falling structure, okay? In particular, what we find that now the two-point function uh, satisfy has a scaling property where given by t goes to lambda power two plus gamma e um, and x goes to lambda x. Okay, so here we see the emergence of Lipschitz scaling. Okay, so which is different than the uh, uh, Schrodinger scaling. So in Schrodinger's we have uh, critical exponent is two, but now we see that there is gamma e, and uh, uh, so um, and this gamma e I just remind you is just uh, two lambda over pi square. Um, Okay, so therefore you see that this critical exponent, uh, ex new critical exponent, um, gives a different scaling. Uh, so and it is not like a Schrodinger um, uh, uh, theory. Okay, at this fixed point, uh, for which gamma is not equal to zero. Now let me show you the phase diagram uh, of uh, this uh, coupling constant. So this phase diagram uh, has an interesting feature actually. Um, so as I said that, that uh, if you look at this uh, beta g and beta lambda, their fixed point. So there are three fixed points here. One is a Gaussian fixed point, one is a, as a pure fixed point, and another is a disorder fixed point. On the other hand, uh, st uh, studying this uh, stability analysis, we see uh, three distinct reasons uh, in this uh, uh, space. Uh, you see that, that uh, for any theories, uh, any microscopic theory, which is below this uh, uh, dotted line, they, uh, if you look at the long distance properties of this, uh, um, uh, this system, they, are, uh, they, they fall in the same univers universality class as the unity Fermi system. On the other hand, uh, any microscopic theory over this dotted line uh, has a, a completely uh, a different, I mean, this are completely disorder uh, universality class. On the other hand, uh, this fixed point here, this, uh, uh, this uh, along this direction has attractive behavior, uh, and this really represents a phase transition, okay? So this, uh, uh, this describes a phase transition between the uh, ordered phase and the disorder phase, okay? Okay, so, um, Okay, so let me uh, now uh, in my talk here. So, um, so as I was saying that that uh, 
uh, real physical systems comes with the uh, uh, defects and impurities and the boundaries, etc. And then it is important to understand how does they affect the critical properties of the system. Um, so we have studied uh, a boundary and random disorder in the critical system. Um, we have computed correlation function and, uh, and the effect of this uh, uh, disorder or uh, boundary on this correlation function. Of course, just uh, connecting the holography, uh, we, uh, so we know that, that um, uh, so not like uh, exactly precise as ADS safety, but uh, there are uh, uh, some holographic uh, uh, trying to connect this uh, uh, conformal uh, Schrodinger symmetry with the holography. And uh, we have can consider space time which has a symmetry, Schrodinger symmetry. So one would be interesting to understand that, uh, like for example, if you have a disorder uh, in the system, then how, what does it correspond to? How does we see from the bulk, from the holographic side? Um, yeah, anyway, uh, thank you. Thanks, Rajesh, for this uh, very, very nice talk. And also, thanks for giving this talk with such a, a challenging physical condition. So, <laughs> so <laughs> OK, so it's time for questions. Just a quick thing, maybe I missed this. So, so when you do the disorder averaging, do you do uh, uh, this quench disorder or? Ah, yeah, this is quench disorder. So this, this is quench. dynamical, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and when, when you uh, so so about your comment on uh, holographic thing uh, of disorder, I mean, do you have any idea of what sort of field? I mean, you want to introduce some new field in the in the geometry on which you want to? Uh, um, actually, I don't know. Um, I, I said the good point. Actually. Um, yeah, I know that there were some work done uh, in the original ADS CFT. I mean, like uh, uh, not non-relativistic, but uh, ADS CFT by um, um, uh, some uh, people. Actually, I forgot the name. Um, so they uh, can realize. So basically, you can introduce a randomness as well uh, in certain coupling constant. Maybe Costas is aware of it. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. static group can be a better than a relativistic group in two dimensions higher. Uh, so uh, are these results consistent with that mapping? Because you said the, the problem with the, with, the, with the defect has been solved in the relativistic case. It was a better to one. Mm. So I, you have to look at uh, the answer in, in the CFT two dimensions higher and use the embedding. That should give the result that you got uh, because just. So uh, sorry, you're talking about this boundary thing actually? Yeah, the boundary thing. Okay. Um, so you're saying that, that uh, so, uh, so the bulk theory has to be two-dimensional higher? No, well, let's forget holography oh, for okay. the moment, uh, just CFT. Yeah. So uh, a relativistic, the, the Schrodinger group embeds in a CFT, in a relativistic CFT in two dimensions higher. That's just a group theory fact. So this means that everything that follows from symmetries, you can just get them from a relativistic system and just use the, the, the specific, uh, specific map. Uh, so uh, if you have uh, a relativistic CFT in two dimensions higher with a boundary, uh, oh, okay. you have a boundary, p people have discussed so the bulk to boundary of E and so on. So then uh, you no, can actually be no. able to. Uh, no, no, that doesn't follow. Actually, I mean, like, for example, um, so you're talking about this, like, null reduction kind of thing? Uh, well, I mean, null reduction, uh, uh, it is related to the null reduction, but it's yeah. a group theoretic fact. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, uh, I remember uh, there was some, uh, actually this point, um, I don't understand, but um, it's not like uh, that you start with the CFT and then you consider non-reduction and obtain the non-relativistic, uh, uh, this correlation functions. It doesn't work like that, actually. Uh, um, well, you can do that uh, as well. Uh, I mean, we've done it both on CFT and with holography, which I see. was my comment. So okay. if you start with the relativistic CFT, there is a specific deformation you can do, okay. which uh, only preserves the Schrodinger group. Okay. And then uh, that, that allows you to go directly from, uh, so if you do directly from the CFT to the, uh, to the non-relativistic. I see, and that can uh, give you all these correlation functions? That should give you the correlation functions. Okay. And then in the, um, for, for the second part, for the disorder, essentially what you do is you turn on if you introduce the bulk field, which is due to the operator you're yeah, turning on, that's true. Mm. then uh, to start with, you need a solution that turns on the source. And second, then you need the path integral to integrate over the source. That would be the, the yeah. fact that this is a disorder. That's true. Uh, so there is a prescription, of course, okay. case. Okay. Doing it explicitly would require some more work, finding yeah. the solution and so right, on. Right, right. 
Yeah, that's true, that's true. So you can now you have uh, say scalar triple which is dual to by 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 star phi. So now you look for solution in the bulk of the scalar field with has a choice behavior. Yeah. So then you do a partial degree of over the choice. Like it's not uh, it's not just a, it will not be the standard polarograph. You have to do it on top of that. Uh, you need to go over the choice. Yeah, it's an additional step. Yeah, it's an additional mm -hmm. step. Uh, so, uh, in the slide that you uh, introduced this anisotropy scaling. Mm. Uh, the first slide you mentioned? Yeah, I think it's okay. the first or second slide. Yeah, yeah, tell me. Uh, so, uh, like, there, uh, th there is like uh, lambda and lambda to power theta, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, theta equal to 2 is this uh, Schrodinger effective. Like, uh, like, what other uh, thetas will correspond to? Like, uh, I mean, are there any known physical systems? I mean, uh, as I was saying, that there are other anisotropy one can introduce definitely. For example, I mean, are there any known physical systems? Uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, uh, but I think uh, experimentists definitely cook up this kind of system. For example, in spatial directions, um, you can introduce, like, for example, here I'm considering all the spatial directions at the same footing, they scale in the same manner. But I think uh, experiment, uh, condensed matter people, they can introduce system where, let's say, uh, one direction, spatial direction, scales differently than the other. And that I mean, it's like uh, in the Schrodinger equation, you are introducing some kind of generalized kinetic term or something. Uh, generalized kinetic, yeah. There could be some kind of uh, generalized kinetic term. There could be something like that. Yeah. So, so, uh, so even for all these uh, uh, various. You can do any value. Okay. Just, uh, the different properties and different values. So okay. Ah, okay, okay, that's a good question. Uh, so basically, all these correlation functions survives only if uh, total uh, MO equal to zero. Because the delta MO is equal to zero. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is zero. So they don't appear. Yeah. It's a super selection technique. Yeah. It's a fixed number. It's a fixed number. It's like the quantum mechanics. You don't super have selection. Uh, So I have a question about the Lipschitz fixed point that you got. It's very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, but these are some simple calculation one can do to understand the uh, like thermodynamic susceptibility. Should be possible, yeah, right? Yeah, from yeah. this. Yeah, we have not done that, uh, but yeah, at these fixed points. Because uh, that's one experimental way to yeah, exactly, verify exactly. it very easily. Yeah, right. So yeah, so question is that what are the various thermodynamic quantities at these points? Yeah. So one could like. To I see, and uh, and these are way to see uh, how do you whether you actually it's real like a really fi uh, Lipschitz fixed point or more, more like going to like a more uh, two or three or something. Two or three. I mean, generally, can you prove that uh, you are reaching a Lipschitz fixed point? Well, more okay, you won't see it f just from the Kalinsky-Mansik, I guess. You have to do more. Well, what? I mean, <laughs> it's just a scaling, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but there could be like, uh, for example, there could be other kind of symmetries like we find for, uh, like if you have the scaling and the point carry, you get the special conformal or some. There's something analog of that in Lipschitz also. I think so. You can get a little bit larger group, I think. But not, not, <coughs> not much. Not much, it's, it's a generic case. So yeah. I mean there are again, special points. Special points, but generically you want to be such a. Actually, it's only scaling. Only scaling. Three plus epsilon, you mean? Yeah, three plus epsilon. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you could do that. In that so sense. Uh, uh, well. Well, I'm Brazilian. Well, actually, the point is that uh, this um, is convenient in the sense that that um, sorry, because this coupling, at least in four dimension, is marginal. Okay. Yeah. And therefore, in epsilon is uh, relevant, so I have a parameter. If we work start at three, then it becomes uh, very strongly interacting. Yeah, yeah. Then perturbation theory is much more harder. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we can.
There can be some operating distraction on dimensions here. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, um, so this system, uh, if, you, if you forget about this uh, 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 deformation, this system uh, has this, uh, if long distance behavior, same as the yeah, Schrodinger invariant symmetry. Uh, just the fixed point of the beta function. Uh, yeah. So from the gamma, uh, you get it. At the so which is, the gamma yeah. 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 So which is exactly this system, actually, okay? So which is, I can say, Schrodinger symmetry, actually, okay? So yeah, so you can think of it as a deformation uh, away from, uh, They are known geometries. But this uh, has a non trivial exponent called gamma e or something, which is a the not an increase. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. You can engineer it to be any. Mm. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, something like this actually takes this. Okay. So I'll try, okay, so I'm relying on memory to actually. Yeah. Okay, that's possible. Okay, I think we should have to break now for tea, and we come back at 4 30 for the last talk by Arvind. And uh, then uh, we have a 15 minute break before the colloquium by Costas. And this will be the one major event of the program. So you can, you're of course uh, invited to attend the colloquium too, which will be at ICSL auditorium just here. It's a very big auditorium. And a lot of people coming, so you can easily it's spot. It's a colloquium for the general public. So yeah, it's a colloquium for the general public. <laughs> So this one, right? No. Yeah. Oh, sure. <coughs> you point it that way. Yeah. <coughs> okay, I think uh, we should get started for interest of time. And uh, so this is the last talk of our co conference, and it will be given by Arvin Shekhar and, uh, from Southampton. And he will tell us about entangled entropy and QFTs that yield islands on d-dimensional ADS black holes. Yep. Oh. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for uh, organizing such an amazing conference. Uh, so yeah, as I just told, I'll be talking about uh, entanglement entropy in higher dimensions. And we'll also see like how the island picture like maybe generalizes to higher dimensions. And uh, we'll see some implications from there. So I'd first like to start off this talk uh, with this quote by Sir Arthur Eddington. So it goes as follows. like. If your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Like, yeah, that's what he told. And uh, John Wheeler, he took it uh, seriously. And uh, he asked the question, like, what happens? Uh, you might have heard this story. Like, what happens to a cup of tea? Like, if you just toss it in a black hole? Like, what happens to the information content? So Birkenstein was uh, Wheeler's uh, PhD student at that point, And uh, he took on this task. and. Uh, he uh, did not ex explicitly calculate anything, but uh, he just showed via dimensional analysis and uh, based on Hawking's area theorem, which just came about at that point, that uh, since the area theorem says that the area of the horizon always increases, so it's a very good candidate for the entropy. <coughs> and uh, so he showed that uh, a black hole could also be analogous to thermodynamic systems with the temperature and entropy. And the story goes that uh, Hawking was skeptical about this, and uh, he, we know that he did the semi-classical analysis, and he actually showed that uh, black holes have a temperature and an entropy that goes like the area, and the temperature goes like uh, the inverse mass. So uh, we know that black holes evaporate. So when black holes evaporate, like uh, they do follow Stephen Boltzmann law. Uh, so dm by dt will go like sigma times the area times t part four, which goes like one by m square. So the mass is decreasing. So if the mass is decreasing, then the area is also decreasing, right? So if the area is decreasing, but uh, that defeats the whole purpose of uh, having uh, the entropy, this entropy associated with the black hole, because the whole motivation was to have the second law of black hole thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics in the case of black holes. So what people usually consider now uh, is the area of the horizon plus the entropy of the radiation that is going out. So uh, this is true in case of uh, any system, right? Like if you don't consider a closed system, like uh, the 
entropy does not follow the second law. So we have to consider a closed system. And in this case, when the black hole evaporates, the closed system involves both the radiation and the entropy of the black hole. And uh, that is what follows the second uh, law. And that is called the generalized entropy. But a more modern understanding of uh, this thermodynamic entropy is uh, entanglement entropy. So this was first put forward by Sorkin. So what is this entanglement entropy? So usually when we take a quantum system, we, some experimenter would not really know what the exact system is, right? So he would take an ensemble of systems and uh, each one of these states would have a classical probability associated with them. And uh, we can uh, have a density matrix and we can have the Shannon entropy associated with the uh, classical probabilities. So when you actually express it in terms of the density matrix, we have the following expression for the uh, entropy of the system. And uh, this is what people call the von Neumann entropy. Now let us uh, take an entangled state, uh, two uh, Hilbert spaces and uh, two states entangled with each other. And uh, for simplicity, let's consider a pure state. Now if you trace out the degrees of freedom, you will find that the subsystem is mixed. And uh, uh, if the subsystem is mixed, it will have a non-zero entropy, right? But this is like somewhat counterintuitive compared to classical me uh, mechanics, right? Like where if you have a joint system where you exactly know the details of the system, uh, which has like a zero entropy, zero Shannon entropy, then the subsystem will also have a zero Shannon entropy. But uh, in the case of quantum mechanics, that is not true because of the quantum mechanical probabilities that also come in. So uh, why did Sorkin uh, propose that the black hole uh, entropy, which goes as the area, should uh, be considered as entanglement entropy? The reason is when you actually uh, take a quantum field theory in a region, take the degrees of freedom in a region, and uh, you consider a density matrix there, and you calculate uh, the entanglement entropy. So there are some subtleties with this, like can you define the density matrix, can you define a pure state, and all that. Uh, but then let's remain agnostic to that for now. Uh, or we can introduce like a cutoff uh, and uh, let us calculate the entanglement entropy, the von Neumann entropy. We will see that uh, it has a divergent piece and the leading divergent piece always goes as the area of the boundary. And uh, this looks very similar to the case of a black hole, right? In the case of a black hole, the boundary is the horizon and uh, the interior and the exterior is like causally disconnected. So the, someone in the ex interior would not know about uh, the exterior modes. So if you bound a region in space-time and uh, consider the entanglement entropy, that is uh, how things are here as well. Uh, the interior modes might not know about the exterior modes. And uh, the leading divergence goes as the area. And somehow gravity seems to reduce uh, the number of degrees of freedom to uh, 4 GN. Uh, so that is what seems to be happening. There are some arguments by Susskind where he considers uh, this uh, G Newton uh, up to one loop and shows that uh, this is a finite uh, quantity. The sum of both uh, the entropy of the radiation and the area of the horizon uh, is a finite quantity, but uh, things are not uh, settled uh, yet. So why consider one loop, for example, why not more? Uh, so, so that is uh, the state of the things now. And there are some things, uh, some uh, expressions that will become useful to us later. So if we consider a pure state, then uh, the von Neumann entropy of, uh, say, a subregion A would be equal to the von Neumann entropy of the subregion A complement. That's one thing we'll use later. And uh, if you uh, act a unitary operation on the density matrix, then because of the trace over here, the von Neumann entropy remains uh, invariant. So you, can, you cannot do some local unitary operations, or uh, you cannot do, uh, send a classical bit and change the entanglement of a system. So we have that. Now let us see what happens in the case of black holes. So let me start, let me treat a black hole as a quantum system and uh, let us take a pure state uh, to describe a black hole. So this is a very ideal case, but let's do that. Uh, now if I take a pure state, it, can, it, it is a definite state, that's what I mean by a pure state. Then as the black hole evaporates, it is going to emit some radiation, which is going to be a thermal state, so it is going to be mixed. Uh, but then that is still fine uh, because we need the entire system to actually have zero entropy or in other words, it should be a pure state, right? If unitarity holds. Uh, that can still be achieved because uh, the black hole itself could be described by a, a density matrix, which is a mixed state. Uh, and uh, the black hole degrees of freedom could still entangle with the radiation degrees of freedom such that the net system is still a pure state. 
But then uh, as the black hole keeps on evaporating more and more, at some point uh, the, there is only radiation left after the black hole completely evaporates. And this is going to be a completely mixed state, right? So it seems like we are going from a pure state to a mixed state. And uh, that cannot happen because under unitary evolution, the entropy uh, cannot uh, change. So it somehow seems like unitarity uh, is lost. But then the problem actually comes much before. Uh, so this is an exaggerated view. But then the problem comes much before. To see that, uh, let us re remind ourselves the notion of fine-grained versus coarse-grained entropy. So let's say we have certain observables like energy and spin, and we are agnostic about spin, like we do not care about spin. Then we'll consider candidate density matrices that have the right expectation values for energy, and there'll be several such candidate density matrices. And we take the von Neumann entropy and take the maximum among the von Neumann entropy, and this would be the coarse grained entropy. Now, one of these density matrices will have the right spin expectation values as well. Uh, and the von Neumann entropy corresponding to that density matrix would be the fine grained entropy. So by definition, the fine grained entropy is always less than the coarse grained entropy. So let's keep that in mind. And now for the black hole, the, th the thermodynamic entropy, uh, we, we are agnostic about certain quantum gravitational degrees of freedom. So this is a coarse grained calculation. Uh, now let us also consider uh, the entropy of the outgoing radiation. The outgoing radiation is a thermal state, right? So as more and more radiation comes out, the entropy of the radiation will keep on increasing. But then I already showed you that uh, if you have a system and its complement that you start uh, from a pure state, then their entropies are going to be uh, the same. So the entropy of the radiation is going to be the entropy of the black hole. So at this point, after this particular time, it seems like the entropy of the radiation will cross the entropy of the black hole. So it seems like the fine-grained entropy becomes more than the coarse-grained entropy. But then let's, so which is already a problem. We, can, we already see the hints of a problem. But let us uh, dig a bit deeper. Uh, so there is uh, this thing called Shannon noiseless coding theorem in quantum information, which states that if you have an entropy S with a system, and if you take n copies of the system and take the n tends to infinity limit, then the number of bell states or bits required to describe the system is ns by ln2. So here, the entropy of the radiation is more than the entropy of the black hole. So the number of uh, bell states that are required to describe the radiation is more than the number of degrees of freedom that are required to uh, uh, describe the black hole. So if we have such a scenario, uh, we cannot have a pure state uh, because the number of uh, degrees of freedom of the radiation are more than the, that of the black hole. So there are not enough degrees of freedom in the black hole to entangle with the radiation and give a pure state. So, at this point, at this point, we somehow tr are trans transitioning to a uh, mixed state. So the problem is uh, right at this point called the page time. Uh, and so, yeah, so unitarity seems to be broken at this point. So that is a problem. And we know like black holes exist thanks to uh, Event Horizon Telescope uh, and thanks to observations from LIGO using gravitational data. We know black holes exist. And we expect in our universe, like information is not lost. Like uh, we have unitarity. Because uh, the whole point of physics is to like uh, to keep track of this information, right? And somehow if the universe suddenly loses information, like uh, it is a bit confusing. Uh, uh, but there could be universes where information is lost as well. And we could model that as well. But we expect such drastic things to not happen. So uh, we would like to look at a resolution that keeps unitarity uh, intact. So what are the uh, essential elements that went into causing this paradox? Let us try to dig that. Uh, first of all, we have uh, a horizon that separates the interior from the exterior. So these are causally disconnected. So it is not very clear how the uh, interior modes are entangled with the exterior modes. For example, if you take this table and say I burn this table, then uh, it is going to emit thermal radiation as well. But then in this case, we do not really have uh, something like a information paradox because uh, the outgoing modes, whatever uh, heat or uh, thermal radiation is going out, is going to be somehow uh, entangled with the table such that it's always going to be a pure state if you start with a pure state. But then in the case of a black hole, it's not clear what this entanglement structure is. Uh, because of uh, the causally disconnected uh, nature of things. Uh, so we have that problem. And then we also have a singularity in the case of black hole where all the interior modes go and uh, end at. So some people proposed, uh, I'm just giving an intuitive picture, but uh, some people proposed uh, via some uh, very backed up calculations that uh, maybe we can consider something like a plaque remnant and uh, all the interior modes just collect on the Planck remnant. Like uh, we don't, don't have a singularity. It just collects on the Planck remnant, and 
at some point in the evaporation process, it becomes available outside. And so there is no, not really an information paradox. But then the problem with that is uh, a Planck remnant has to be like really, really small and holds such huge amount of information. So uh, that seems like not such a plausible idea. Uh, but then uh, the curve that we have here already is pointing, us, uh, pointing to us uh, what the solution might as well be. Because once we understand the problem, we can figure the solution. So going by that, what is the problem here? The problem is that the fine grain entropy of the black hole crosses the coarse grain entropy of the black hole. So what we really need is uh, for that not to happen. So the minimal resolution would be to associate an entropy to the black hole somehow, such that uh, the entropy never crosses the coarse grain entropy or the area, be area dependence uh, of the entropy in the case of the black hole. So we consider uh, this blue curve. Uh, this is called the page curve. And we expect that uh, in uh, theory with no information paradox, like uh, we would have the black hole's entropy going like that as the black hole evaporates. So it could be any curve under this uh, triangle, actually. So, and there still won't be an information paradox. So we have that. And this is like a minimal resolution because we don't really care about the exact details of the dynamics. Uh, we don't care what happens at every stage of the black hole. All we care about is like, what happens if I take all these dynamics and uh, I calculate some macroscopic quantity like uh, entropy and uh, see uh, how the entropy behaves. So this is like very similar to how we discovered atoms actually, right? So we actually did kinetic theory of gases and uh, we took a microscopic description, did kinetic theory. And then uh, we found some macroscopic quantities that matched with experiments. So the nature is similar here, except we don't have experimental data. We are just trying to get rid of a paradox. So we are somehow doing some sort of a kinetic theory of gases, uh, but for black holes. So uh, one of our best known uh, correspondences or theory is uh, the ADS CFT correspondence. And maybe uh, it can shed some light upon like uh, what kind of entropy one can associate to the black hole, such that the page curve is like followed. So first of all, the boundary CFT in the case uh, in this in the uh, in the conformal boundary of ADS is unitary. So since it is unitary, maybe we can use the holographic correspondence to associate an entropy to the bulk uh, black hole, such that uh, there is no information paradox. So that is one expectation. And the second expectation is. Uh, can we, this is a more ambitious expectation, uh, can we associate a semi-classical uh, uh, sort of uh, entropy without resorting to quantum gravitational details and still recover the page curve? So that is a bit ambitious and uh, it could or could not be possible. Uh, but let us see, uh, it turns out that it is actually possible. That's the spoiler alert. Like uh, there, this is exactly the island prescription, like associating a semi-classical entropy such that we recover the page curve. So let us, uh, before seeing that, let us actually try to understand what, how to calculate entanglement entropy. So then we can go to like the holographic description and then associate what the dual quantities are and what sort of entropy one can associate in the bulk. And uh, we can see whether it resolves the paradox. So first of all, let, let me consider uh, this density matrix, which is a Gibbs state, which is a thermal state, and it has a temperature one by beta. Now, uh, if I want to take the trace of this uh, density matrix, what I can do is I can calculate uh, the path integral, but by going to Euclidean time and like taking uh, delta tau to be beta of length beta. So if we calculate the Euclidean path integral of uh, circle length beta, then that corresponds to trace of uh, the density matrix. So you can just do the path integral and to go to Euclidean time and see, compactify the time direction uh, to length beta and see this. And then one more important quantity that will become useful to us is the concept of uh, Rennie entropies. So when we, to calculate the entropy of uh, the von Neumann entropy, you need to uh, take the density matrix. If you take like a quantum mechanical system with the n states, then it, this is going to be an n cross n matrix. And then you have to take the logarithm of that, which is like a computationally difficult task. So what we can do is instead, uh, we can calculate something called the Rennie entropy. And there are uh, one for each n. Uh, so instead, we take the trace of a polynomial of the density matrix, and then we get a number, and then we take the logarithm of that. And why is this useful, though? Uh, this is useful because, uh, as uh, Rajesh mentioned in the previous talk, uh, if we take the limit n tends to 1, uh, then we recover uh, the von Neumann entropy. Uh, but this, of course, requires that uh, we can analytically, we are able to analytically continue to real values of n as well. So to take, to approach this limit. So yeah, one can work out this limit and verify that, that we recover the von Neumann entropy. 
But then, uh, how did a computationally difficult task became, uh, become a computationally you know, easy task? That, that is not what's really happening. Uh, as was mentioned in the previous talk, there is a hidden cost. So what is this hidden cost? The hidden cost is, uh, what is this trace row per n? We know what trace row is. It is the Euclidean path integral over circle length uh, of time length beta. But uh, what is this trace row per n? So what this is, is the following. You take like n copies of the uh, manifold uh, on which you have the QFT, and then you glue it along the entangling region. If this is uh, the tau direction, the Euclidean time direction, then you glue, uh, you identify uh, fields from here to here, uh, as is shown in the figure. So I just made like a cutout sort of thing. Like uh, if I just take a Rindler wedge on, uh, on a manifold, on a two-dimensional manifold, like you can identify uh, this part with this, and uh, you'll have something like this. So you'll have some sort of a screw, corkscrew type of identification of the fields. So you can do something like that, and uh, you need the Euclidean time to now have a period 2 pi n, you, because you have like n copies of them. So, uh, so this uh, is the n-manifold, and we take this n-manifold, and then we calculate the path integral, the Euclidean path integral on this. So this uh, Euclidean path integral, uh, if normalized properly, would correspond to Zn by Z1 whole power n. Uh, and that would be equal to trace rho power n, and that is what the trace rho power n is. So we can already see that uh, this is, uh, again, computationally difficult, but just masquerading in a different form. So anyways, uh, let us try to simplify our life, maybe, using this Zn symmetry. What is this Zn symmetry? Like, you take, uh, you have the n copies of the manifold, if I interchange any two copies of the manifold, then it seems like uh, the manifold still remains the same. So maybe what we can do is we can quotient this uh, over Zn, quotient the manifold over Zn, and now we have a, like a one manifold. And when we, but this one manifold does not have the same metric on the one manifold we started with. So it will have the metric uh, same everywhere in between, but then the Zn symmetry might not act smoothly. So what really happens is uh, it could have like a conical singularity around the boundary of the entangling region. So uh, what do I mean by conical singularity? Like again, if I take like a sheet of paper, then you, the metric you can have on this is like dr squared plus let's, let's say r squared d phi squared. And you need the phi direction to, be, I, uh, to have a period 2 pi. If I don't have period 2 pi, let's say I cut out like an angle. Now you'll see that uh, it has, uh, I mean it's flat everywhere except at uh, this point. Where, you, where the receive would diverge if you calculate. So there would be a conical singularity, and this is the sort of conical singularity that you have uh, on the boundary of the entangling region over here. Uh, so one has to take that into account. So that is what we have. So I, 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 so I already told you what the metric would be when you have a conical singularity. So the metric around the boundary would be something like this. And if we are in a general d-dimensional scenario, then you take uh, the induced metric on the boundary of the entangling region as well, and derivatives with respect to the induced metric as well, and you'll have uh, this metric around the boundary. So uh, here I've chosen like a rho psi coordinate at the boundary, uh, such that rho cos psi is uh, some r epsilon, rho sine psi is tau epsilon around the boundary, and uh, this would be the metric. One can also view this uh, conical singularity as coming from the introduction of a cosmic brain with the following tension. Uh, yeah, so you can also do that. So, but that is just a calculation trick at the end of the day. It's nothing physical. Now, one can go ahead and see what uh, uh, this, this entanglement entropy of the boundary CFT corresponds to in the bulk uh, using the holographic dictionary. Uh, so you can calculate it, but Ryo and Takanagi first proposed uh, it as a conjecture, and uh, they verified it for a few models. And what they showed is, uh, if you take like a boundary entangling region, like you have a boundary CFT, take an entangling region, and if you want to calculate the entanglement entropy on this boundary, what you can really do is you can take like candidate uh, surfaces that go in the bulk. First of all, we go to a constant time slice, and then we take candidate surfaces that go in the bulk and share the shares the boundary with the entangling region. There will be several such candidate surfaces, but you have to choose the candidate surface that has like minimum area, and the entanglement entropy will be the one with uh, uh, minimum area, the area of the minimum area curve uh, in the unit of 4G h bar. So, yeah. Left or over? I see. Okay. <laughs> Fine. 
Okay, so yeah, so you can go ahead and calculate in one plus one dimensions. You would calculate a geodesic, and the entanglement entropy dependence will go like this. It'll be logarithmic. And uh, now let us try to see like what are the O1 corrections. We know the O1 by h bar uh, term is uh, goes as the area. So what are the O1 corrections? So Wall and Engelhardt actually gave these corrections. So what you have to do is take candidate surfaces, but this time don't just minimize over the area, but also minimize over the entropy of the bulk quantum field. So take the sum and minimize this. And uh, this surface that you get is called the quantum uh, extremal surface. And uh, it is uh, this thing that one has to calculate to also include the O1 corrections. So people went ahead and uh, much later, they tried to use this in the case of JT gravity. So JT gravity is nothing but Einstein-Hilbert action, but with a coupling uh, scalar field. Uh, the reason for this is uh, if you just take Einstein-Hilbert action, uh, this is just the Euler number, it's a topological term. So any two solutions would just be related by a coordinate transformation globally. So you introduce a scalar field and with uh, appropriate boundary conditions, you would have the solution uh, for the metric to be this and solution for the deltaon to be this. And now you can take the uh, bulk entanglement entropy. I showed you the entanglement entropy over here in flat space time, it goes as the logarithm. But then in uh, ADS2 in curved space time, you would have some conformal factors so that you have to account. The conformal factors is just x over here. You account for this, and this will be the bulk entanglement entropy. So you take the entangling region that you take is a point on the boundary and a point in the interior at x. And now let's try to find the uh, quantum extremal surface. Uh, and in this case, this point is just going to be zero dimensional, right? So what is the area of this? The area of this is going to be the value of the deltaon at this point. So you take the sum of both and then you minimize and you find that this gets minimized at a finite point. So if you had just taken the area term instead of considering the O1 correction, then it would have uh, been all the way to infinity. Uh, but now we have it at a finite point. And now if you take like a pure state, the entropy of uh, this region, this entangling region that you got, is going to be the entanglement entropy of the uh, complement region, right? So as opposed to the previous case, we suddenly have a new region that is appearing, which is disconnected from the asymptotic boundary. And this new region is what we call the island. And uh, if you do these calculations in uh, the case of a temperature, uh, a system with a temperature, here it's a zero temperature case, uh, you will see that uh, you can recover the page curve. The presence of this island recovers the page curve. But why does it recover the page curve? Let us try to intuitively see that. The reason is, let us compare the island versus no island scenario. Uh, without island, uh, if you have uh, some paired modes produced at the horizon, one of the modes will go inside, one of the modes will come outside, which is captured by the observer at infinity, right? Now, if you consider just this entangling region, then all you capture is like one of the paired modes. And because of that, the entropy will keep on increasing. But then suddenly, because of the presence of islands, now you will capture both the paired modes. And because of that, uh, the entanglement entropy will start decreasing uh, again. So uh, we can already intuitively see why islands might uh, reduce the entropy and recover the page curve. But then before page time, there are no islands according to the QS prescription. After the page time, uh, why do islands show up? The reason before page time, there are not many paired modes. So the decrease in SQFT given by the QS prescription is uh, much less than the area term that uh, the island brings along with it. So because of this, there are no islands to begin with, but then as uh, time goes on, more and more paired modes are produced, and uh, the entropy of the QFT uh, reduces significantly as compared to the cost that the island produces in the form of the area term. And because of that, uh, a finite quantum extremal surface appears, an island appears, and because of that, uh, you start uh, having the page curve uh, again. So yeah, in our case, so this is the, what we are working. In our case, we just uh, circularly uplift uh, the JT calculation to ADS3 using the colors of plane and sats. I won't go into the details of this, but let's quickly go through uh, just the results uh, since we have very less time. Did you use the ADS3 to ADS2 no, uh, opposite. Like take the ADS2 and circularly uplift it to ADS3. But that does not guarantee that the entropy will remain the same. Uh, if we calculate, we can again use RT formula by putting uh, this ADS. Okay, first let me see. Okay, maybe let's, let me skip this. If I calculate, you'll find that the bulk uh, entanglement entropy, if you take an entangling region between x1 and x2 in point coordinates, 
you would if you can you can use the RT prescription again, and uh, you can also use some symmetry arguments, and you would find that the entanglement entropy goes like this. It has a one by delta x dependence, uh, so that's like a candidate RT surface. Uh, the entangling region spans all values of C, so we have circularly uplifted, so it is going to span all values of the angular direction, but then it has like a finite length in the x uh, coordinate. So the dependence is going to be this, the renormalized entanglement entropy dependence. But then uh, the area also brings with it uh, like a divergent piece because this is the famous Escher diagram. Like uh, as you go closer and closer to the boundary, even smaller regions produce like uh, higher and higher uh, area contributions. So at the boundary, it will be like infinite. So you have to like put a cutoff epsilon and uh, you have to take the area going from epsilon to some row naught in the bulk and calculate that area. So of course there'll be like a divergence coming from the area contributions at the boundary. And the divergence in the case of ADS3 will be this. Now the question is, uh, what should we really consider? Should we consider the renormalized or the regulated entanglement entropy? So you can either add covariant counter, counter terms and get rid of the divergent piece and consider the renormalized piece that I showed. Or you can treat this uh, cutoff as uh, describing something physical and this as being an effective field theory and maybe like uh, the demand of islands to recover the page curve would actually fix this uh, cutoff. So we can take that approach as well. So we will take both. Uh, and then, yeah. Yes. But that is up to just one loop, right? Like one loop, yeah. So here the divergence is purely coming from going to the boundary. Boundary, yes. And this is not the same divergence that uh, it is the same divergence yes, because we are yeah, we are just calculating the entanglement entropy of the boundary CFT at the end of the day. In the three D case we put the uh, yeah, in the 3D case, we put the ADS3 on the boundary of like a four dimensional space time, ADS4C metric, and uh, we use RT on this one higher dimensional space time to calculate the entanglement entropy of the CFT on the boundary ADS3. This is not, say, SGEN. This is not SGEN, this is just the bulk entanglement entropy of uh, entangling region uh, in. Huh. Uh, it does not. No, this is divergent. This is just the bulk entanglement entropy. I, I still haven't added the area term. But as the entangling region moves to the boundary, the value of the direction also increases. That's like pi by epsilon. So it increases by 1 over epsilon. But that won't be the area term, right? The area term in this case will be something else, right? Okay, now I thought we were taking ADS3. No, no, ADS3. This is ADS3 calculation. We are taking uh, boundary ADS3 an entangling region in boundary ADS3 in a four dimensional space time and uh, we are using RT prescription. So effectively we are calculating the entanglement entropy of a region in bulk ADS3. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so, and the area term will go like this. You take the induced metric on the uh, boundary of your entangling region and calculate the area term. And in the case of ADS3, it will go like this. So maybe I think you're talking about the divergences that come in G3. And if you consider that along with the divergence that comes in the bulk, then uh, it might be finite. From the value of the direction. Like the direction also hmm. the value of the direction of the boundary is, is like 1 over epsilon. This is not the entire dilaton profile. It is just the uh, parameter, dilaton parameter. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so we can take both and let us try to see uh, where the quantum extremal surface is in this case. So we first take the renormalized piece, which goes as 1 by delta x, and then we have the area piece, which goes as 1 by x. And uh, if you take uh, x1 to be at 0, which is the conformal boundary, you see that uh, if you extremize, x2 is going to be at minus infinity. So in this case, we need the QS to be at a finite point to actually have an island, right? And in this case, uh, that is not true. So what about the divergent piece? So if we take the divergent piece, the divergent piece also goes like the area piece up to some constants. Uh, and so if you add the divergent piece, the story is not going to change. So again, the QS will be at uh, minus infinity. So there are no islands, no matter what you consider, which one you consider. And we did the calculations in BTZ as well. And in this case, if you take, uh, these are the dependences, uh, the bulk dependence and the 
area dependence. And if you take one of the points at the horizon, the QS is going to be at infinity. So again, there are no islands in BTZ case as well. So it seems like there are no islands, but this is uh, surprising, right? Because in one plus one dimensions, we had islands, and suddenly, like in three dimensions, we don't seem to have islands. And so what is really going on? So first of all, uh, the black hole background has a scale. So maybe uh, we can't describe uh, the QFT uh, coupled to the black, uh, black hole as uh, a scaleless theory, right? So maybe we need to consider more generic QFTs. And uh, one more thing is in one plus one dimensions, there is conformal anomaly, which is not there in uh, higher dimensions, right? So maybe this anomaly is playing a role because in one plus one dimensions, uh, the bulk dependence was logarithmic. And that dependence came from the conformal anomaly. So, and that was important because that was what was competing with the phi by x, which is the area term, and producing like a finite uh, QES. But that is not there in ADS3. Uh, we don't have an anomaly in uh, bulk ADS3, right? So maybe that is playing a role. So we will take the QES prescription and we will try to see uh, what should be the constraints on the theory if uh, there has to be uh, islands, yeah. So the setup will be as follows. Like we will take static ADS black holes. So just uh, this metric. Uh, in the case of static ADS black hole, the horizon uh, is not just going to be spherical. We, uh, we can also have toroidal horizons and hyperbolic horizons as well. So that will be the black hole background. And uh, we will take QFTs, generic QFTs, on this d-dimensional backgrounds. And uh, these QFTs uh, should just be renormalizable. That's all we demand. So it should have relevant and marginal operators. And this coupling has to be renormalizable. And then what is our entangling region? Since there is symmetries in the angular directions, so we span all the angular directions, but just take a finite uh, width in the uh, R direction. So it will be uh, R going between R1 and R2. So we take this and uh, we try to see when will there be islands. So we take the QS prescription to be uh, the sacros santum thing and we will try to see when there are islands. So what are we really doing? We are taking the entropy of the bulk QFT and the area term. And then we are minimizing over candidate uh, points in R, right? So when we actually do that, what we should really do uh, if we need to have this at a finite point is that this has to become zero at uh, R2. And for R less than R2, this has to be less than zero. For R greater than R2, this has to be greater than zero. And all the information about the QFT is sitting inside this SQFT. So if you can compute this SQFT and uh, impose these constraints, then you should be able to see uh, constraints on the theory. So that is the idea. So all we need to know is not, we do not even need to know the bulk uh, entanglement entropy. All that we need to know is the scaling uh, with R of the bulk entanglement entropy. That's all we need to see with, uh, when there will be islands. So uh, we can do that. And this scaling in the R direction will depend upon uh, scaling of the metric, of the background metric. So we will use replica trick. And uh, when we take, I, I already told that there are conical singularities in the boundary. So one has to consider that and regulate those to get the metric on the n-manifold. Uh, this was done by Solodokin, and uh, if you take the cu curvature on this n-manifold, it will get boundary corrections compared to the one-manifold. So you have to uh, account for all that, and if you do the replica trick, ultimately all the results will get uh, localized to contributions from around the boundary. And uh, you will have the entanglement entropy, the scaling with R of the entanglement entropy, depending upon uh, the trace of the stress tensor, the anomaly of the QFT, the dilatation anomaly of the QFT, and uh, the energy and momentum of the QFT. So, uh, and we can go ahead and impose the constraints that I told you, and this will give corrections on uh, these quantities, uh, basically. So that is the idea. So what sort of work are we uh, trying to do? Like, we want to see like when there will be islands, of course, and we want to interpret them in the holographic dual. Uh, that's one thing, and it would be. Yes, so what are the QFTs that describe the outgoing radiation? And uh, it can't be, like for example, in ADS-3 when we took a CFT, there were no islands, right? So that is not like a, that would not satisfy such a constraint. So this is a constraint on the space of theories uh, that uh, the outgoing radiation could be described by. Or one more way to look at it is that the island program itself uh, might not be the right thing to look at, and maybe we need like corrections coming from quantum gravity, uh, which, uh, Bartlemek actually was talking to me about the other day, yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, we of course want to see like uh, what ha we took a static case, so we want to take a rotating black hole case and see uh, what happens in that case. Over there, it's not just the scaling in the R direction, but uh, the scaling in the theta direction will also become important. In the other angular directions, will become important. Then maybe we can try to connect it to microstates and see uh, what uh, this these constraints and what this islands correspond to in the microstate story. And then one more uh, thing I told you is. Um, uh, we are trying to have like a minimal resolution. Like uh, we just want to recover the page curve, but then it would be interesting to see what happens like fundamentally, dynamically. So maybe uh, we can try to see, since the QS is what is producing islands, maybe we can try to see like what is the mo modification to Einstein field equations when we take the QS prescription. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Let's thank Arvin for this very nice talk and now we have question time. So Arvin, just one question. Yeah. Yes, we are not considering back reaction at all. So, but like, when you derive the constraint from stress transfer, yeah. uh, it should make sure that it's self consistent in the sense that a back reaction is small, right? Like, if you put some of our term QES, but with like very large stress transfer for the much faster, then that would invalidate the scenario or. Uh, the cons right? I mean, yeah, I think without back reaction, you don't even get islands, no, because you have to wait for, you have to actually wait for at least the page time, and only the island starts appearing. That's like a first order case. But we don't consider back yeah, reaction, yeah. right? We don't consider back reaction. Right. So the, uh, we are just uh, I mean, evolving the space time. Just. Yes. Yes. Back reaction, oh, you mean back reaction on the yeah. gravity? That is what you're ignoring? Or? Yeah, we are not like uh, including like matters back reaction on, on the metric. But isn't that necessary to even have the islands for the first place? Because <coughs> you have to wait until page time and so you, you consider the entanglement in the evaporating geometry, no? Right. Or, oh no, not. I mean, of course you map it back, you map it back to the usual ADS2 with some, uh, using this uh, diffeomorphism <laughs> trick, but yeah, so you can always do that, but that produces this non-trivial extra F factors, which you have to take into account when you compute the entanglement entropy of this <laughs> interval. <laughs> is this, like you delta, the factors that you showed mm -hmm. comes from the fact that there is a time dependent geometry, which is where the Schwarzian is decreed. Uh, Schwarzian is, uh, the Schwarzian is actually uh, decaying exponentially and that you solve for the, uh, you solve for the time, uh, time repair metrization uh, in this context, it comes out to be some Bessel function. Hmm. And that appears in the entanglement entropy when, when you compute the 4.5. Ultimately, you, rem you kind of map it back to a straight line with this, uh, you, in you undo this uh, e evaporation. But then this factor is important when you, uh, that factor is, without that factor, you do not get the transition in the, you don't find the island. So I was thinking that so, uh, that's, so maybe I'm misunderstanding something here. You have to wait until the yes, page yes. for it to appear, and the back reaction is important because you actually take into account when the CFT evaporation, how this black hole is evaporating, and then you solve, solve for the Schwarzian, <laughs> like Schwarzian prime is equal to some central charge times the Schwarzian. Yes, yes, yes. And then when you, after you solve this with some initial conditions, you get some T of U. With the, and, and you have to, that T of U used to, uh, Basically, to undo it and make map it back to PO radius two, mm -hmm. and that produces, of course, the conformal. Uh, okay, that. Uh, but that once you do that, uh, those factors appear in the four point function. Now you have to take when you map it back. You have to take into account those extra conformal yes. factors. Yes. Uh, in the four point function that computes the entanglement entropy, and without that, you do not. Uh, that's important to see the f uh, phase transition. But uh, if, I, the, if I remember correctly, I mean. In the zero temperature case, for example, like the one I showed, right? Here, yeah, here we didn't have to do anything like that, right? So this is just the bulk entanglement entropy. And this would just receive corrections uh, because we are in ADS2 in the form of conformal factors. Yeah, this is what I think I don't completely hmm. understand because if I remember the original hmm. calculation had this back reaction was important.
Yeah, so what is here it is. Yeah, I was talking about the evaporating model, but yeah, he, it, this is not an evaporating. No, no, there is uh, there where is the horizon. there is a horizon. Yes. Oh, this is basically the eternal eternal, eternal black hole. Yeah, I see. No, that's probably a different computation. But still, uh, without back reaction, would you expect such so a island? Back so if you read the original Maldasana paper, also I think the claim was that this appears only at very late time. Islands do not are not. Uh, do you have to? No, no, we are not, uh, gravity is always uh, classical in every all these com computations, the AEMM model and all this, but uh, you, even if you take gravity classically, you have to wait until page time for the island to appear. If yes, yes, the island appears at the page time itself. Yeah, it's There's not no like islands before. before that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but that, that is important, so the back reaction is, be, uh, otherwise what's the difference between page time and non-page time, unless you consider some back reaction, right? Hmm. So this is what I don't get. I mean, many of these island calculations uh, can also be done within the context of doubly holographic models, where basically you have, let's say, ADS-4 in your case, and you insert some brain, which is like an ADS-3. Hmm. And then what you do is purely an RT calculation. Yeah. And as far as I know, if you do purely an RT calculation of that kind, you do, you do find uh, islands. Just simply because your RT surfaces, because there's a brain, on that brain, the, the, the RT surface will end. And uh, from a defect point of view, it will look like yes, an island. You are including uh, a scale, right, by introducing this. Yes, yes, brain. exactly. So, so when you do that, hmm. the the dual CFT description of that, hmm. if it exists, let's say, let's assume it exists, hmm. it would be in some sense taking the back reaction into account because these these brains are not probes. These brains are hmm. uh, honest to god back reacting brains okay. in the, in the geometry. So I'm also wondering whether uh, that could be a reason. The deleton profile sets a scale, right? Yeah, the yeah. central charge and deleton yeah. profile will set a scale, and uh, that is what sets the scale for the page time. Right. So, right. so right. I think the point is that if you do holographic hmm. CFT, like a doubly holographic model, yes. then you would naturally expect the island. But what you're saying, for any CFT, you won't get it. So this seems to be a contradiction. No, but uh, in that case, there's a defect also, right? So no, it's not just okay. the so defect will set a scale. So, and yeah, and also a comment on what you were saying, like in the case of a brain, there's a defect, right? So if you take the dilatation word identity, like we won't just have an anomaly, but we'll also have a defect term, right? So that will come in over there. So we did not consider defects here, so we don't have that term. But those terms will come also in the constraint. So, 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 what so what I, I was wondering is that I'm So in the original island papers, both the, uh, uh, yeah, the a key technical, maybe not technical, a key conceptual innovation was to take the radiation and separate it and like sink it into that reservoir so yes. that it's not in the, yeah. Yes. Can you explain where in your calculation you did that and how your conclusions would be different if you didn't take the radiation into the reservoir? So uh, we did not actually, okay. In my calculation, I can tell like where that comes in. And uh, obviously I'm asking this question because I, uh, as I was looking, I didn't really see that step. And that step is essential for islands to arise. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't completely agree that a bath is always necessary. Uh, to discuss about uh, recovering the page curve, I mean, we can also do without a bath, right? It could be possible. Uh, the only reason we include a bath is because uh, the black hole would, would reach equilibrium uh, much before the page time. Uh, when we have like reflecting boundary conditions. But unless the bath has sufficient number of degrees of freedom, you don't ex expect the uh, island to form. So in the, at least in the usual, so maybe you're proposing a departure from the usual story, but in mm. the usual island story, 
you are uh, the the page curve arises from the intersection of those two entropy curves. Yes. Those two entropy curves correspond to two different candidate uh, quantum extremal surfaces, which mm. exchange dominance. Yes. Uh, one of them is characterized by the fact that its entropy is only coming from the area, but not from the mm. bulk term. Mm. The other one is characterized by uh, it coming entirely from the bulk term without the area term. It seems like in your calculation, the you were asking a question about islands, but you were never say you didn't do anything to uh, to engineer uh, a f that this candidate uh, quantum extremal surface would have an entropy coming entirely from the area term without the bulk term. The island, when it arises, has that feature. No. Uh, okay. Uh, all we need is like transparent boundary conditions, right? We don't essentially need to have like a flat bar. No, but what he's saying is basically, I would like rephrase hmm. it another way. As you see in the West Coast model, until, hmm. unless a bath has sufficient number of degrees of freedom, you won't find the island to appear in the first place. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, Arvind, but I'm going to yeah. make one more comment, which might be useful. Uh, which is that, uh, so Subrat Raju uh, uh, has, uh, I mean, he's famous for many things, but one of the things that he is recently famous for is for saying that islands don't work because the moment you put the radiation in the reservoir, hmm. then the graviton becomes massive and you hmm. no longer are talking about yeah, the same so thing. Yes. So he says islands don't work for that reason. Hmm. But if you're not doing that, then that's a little bit like saying Suvrat's argument com uh, is completely beside the point because you don't even need to put this radiation in the <laughs> reservoir. And uh, so, so there is a, even before asking the question, when do you have islands and so, so on, you could phrase your conclusions, if you believe them, as a, uh, as a reply to Suvrat. Yes, it might uh, actually be more yeah, interesting. I, I'm aware of that criticism. and. It is because of th that criticism, like we d try to get away, like without a bath, like. Okay, I think sorry, we have to end this now, uh, okay, okay. because uh, yeah, we can discuss later. Yeah, because of uh, we have to now go to we have to have the colloquium. Uh, so anyway, thanks for this. For, thanks for being here and for this marvelous conference. But first, thanks, Arvind again. Thank you. And. Uh, Thanks to all of you for having participating. Thanks to our videographer and the team, and especially Vinod and Lisa for organizing all this beautifully and helping us organizing it very efficiently for us. And yeah, I hope to see you all here again and be, let's be all in touch and start continue the interactions and meeting each other somewhere <laughs> all over the world. And I hope you all have a safe travel back to your working place back. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much.